All right, it's nine o'clock. We will now begin today's public workshop. So good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Welcome and thank you for joining the public workshop for the informal staff draft of the Sanitary Sewer Systems General Order. My name is Greg Ogden Chand, and I'm a water resource control engineer here in the Division of Water Qualities and PDES Wastewater Unit at the State Water Board. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of serving as your meeting facilitator. Co-facilitating with me today is Steve Chung, who I will introduce in further detail in just a minute. To start off, I wanna take the opportunity and extend a warm welcome and thank each of you for finding a way to join us virtually. As we start this public workshop, I'd like to begin by introducing our program staff. Today, we have staff from the Division of Water Quality, the Office of Enforcement, Office of Chief Counsel, all within the State Water Board, and staff from the various regional water boards who will either be presenting or working behind the scenes to make this workshop possible. Starting with the Division of Water Quality, we have Afuz Farsimadat, the Wastewater Permitting Unit Chief, Walter Mobley, the Program Manager for the Sanitary Sewer System General Order, Steve Chung, who I mentioned earlier, is the Co-Project Manager of the Sanitary Sewer System General Order, and Diana Messina, the Surface Water Permitting Section Chief. I'd also like to acknowledge Karen Mogus, the Deputy Director of the Division of Water Quality, and Phil Crater, the Assistant Deputy Director. Over at the Office of Enforcement, we have Brian Elder, and from the Office of Chief Counsel, we have Tim Regan, Naomi Rubin, and Laura Drabon. And from the Regional Water Boards, starting with the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board, we have Michael Chi. From the Los Angeles Regional Water Board, we have Russ Kobe. And from the Lahontan Regional Water Board, we have Jahil Cass and Molina Hov. Working behind the scenes to put this uh, workshop together, we have Ella Golovi, Paul Levy, Tiana Huling, Sheena Dillon, Mary Boyd, Salvador Chaparro, and our Cal EPA webcasting staff. And finally, uh, we also have, uh, for folks joining us today via Zoom, uh, we have Mark Gutierrez who will be providing um, interpretation services in Spanish. As acknowledgement, we are hosting this meeting virtually from Sacramento. We welcome and thank each of you for joining us today and appreciate your participation while many people are concurrently dealing with the continued impacts of the pandemic on our communities. The mission of the Water Boards is to preserve, enhance, and restore California's water resources for the benefit of both present and future generations. Our boards conduct our work through a public process to strengthen the empowerment of all community voices as we work together to provide clean, safe, and affordable water to all Californians. As some background on this project, in February of 2006, the State Water Board adopted the first statewide sanitary sewer system general order for consistent statewide regulation of publicly owned sanitary sewers. In 2018, State Water Board staff recognized the need to update the order and has since been conducting outreach throughout California for input on a proposed order reissuance. With the outreach efforts staff has performed so far, I want to highlight that staff is also looking to seek opportunities for further communication with small and disadvantaged community representatives. And then additionally, as recently as February of 2021, the State Water Board issued a public notice announcing the availability of the informal staff draft of the statewide Sanitary Sewer Systems General Order for the intent of further informal conversation. Two public workshops for discussion of the draft components were scheduled. The first one was held earlier this week on April 13, 2021 from 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. The second one is being held right now on April 16, 2021 from 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. The purpose of today's workshop is to provide an overview of the informal draft order and allow interested parties to provide feedback to staff and ask questions. All information provided during this workshop will be available at the Sanitary Sewer Systems Program webpage in which the URL is displayed on the slide show, as shown. You don't have to jot down the URL as this presentation will be posted online for future reference. It should be noted, however, that this workshop is not for public written comments 
on the informal staff draft of the statewide sanitary sewer system general order. On this slide, here you can see some of the guidelines and logistics for this workshop. The workshop is being recorded and webcasted. And as I mentioned, our discussion today is for informational purposes only. No written responses to comments will be provided and no formal action will be taken. We will try our best to respond to all of your questions to the best of staff's ability. This PowerPoint presentation and the recording of the workshop will be posted on the Sanitary Sewer Systems Program webpage following the conclusion of all scheduled workshops. If you would like to stay updated and involved throughout the process, please sign up for the LIRIS email subscription for further updates on the Water Board's website. Today, there are two options for viewing and participating in the workshop. Option one is the Cal EPA webcast, which is for viewing and listening in only. Option two is through Zoom, which is an interactive platform where you can ask questions and provide feedback. If you are not planning to ask questions or provide feedback, we ask that you view the webcast at video.calepa.ca.gov. For those of you who are registered in advance for the Zoom meeting, we will admit you to the meeting, but you will be on mute until it's your turn to speak. Here on this side, please note that uh, the slide contains uh, instructions and how, on how to uh, submit questions and comments. We request the Zoom chat feature to submit questions. We request you to utilize the Zoom chat feature to submit questions or feedback. You have the option to ask your question or provide feedback yourself or have state water board staff read your question or comment. If you would like to speak, please enter voice my question prior to submitting your question or comment and the facilitator will work on unmuting you. Once you have had the opportunity to speak, you will then be muted. If you do not wish to speak, please enter in staff read my question in the Zoom chat box. To answer as many questions or comments as possible, we ask that you are concise and ask your question or limit your comment within three minutes. If you're having any Zoom technical issues with the workshop or the webcast, please send an email to sanitary sewer at waterboards.ca.gov with the subject technical issues and we can help troubleshoot. We will pull the slide back up once we get to the questions and comments session of today's workshop. And on this slide, you can see today's workshop agenda. Once I wrap up the introduction and logistics for today's workshop, Diana Messina will present the informal staff draft of the Sanitary Sewer System General Order. We will then proceed to take a quick 15 minute break in which we will continue off with the question and comment session. In between the question and comment session, we will have a, a 10 minute break around the 1130-ish mark. And then finally, we will conclude uh, we will resume with the question and comment session. We will finally conclude the meeting by discussing the next steps for, or, for the order of reissuance process. Please note that future notices concerning further development of this order will be posted on the Sanitary Sewer Overflow Reduction Program webpage in which the URL is shown below. We also recommend that you sign up for the LIRIS email list to get updated email notifications. The LIRIS email a form to subscribe to future notices is located also on the URL, URL shown on this slide. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to jot down the URLs as this, this presentation will be posted on the Sanitary Sewer Systems Program webpage following the conclusion of all scheduled workshops. And now I'd like to reintroduce Diana Messina who will be leading us through the informal staff draft of the Sanitary Sewer System General Order. As mentioned, Diana is the Surface Water Permitting Section Chief. Diana, the floor is all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Greg Doggin. All right, so good morning. My name's Diana Messina, as Greg Doggin just mentioned. I'm the Chief over the Statewide Surface Water Permitting. Um, in our Division of Water Quality at the State Water Board. This is the staff presentation of the informal draft statewide sanitary sewer system general order. Um, 
As Gergaden stated, this is the second public workshop this week. Today's staff presentation will be the same as the presentation provided during uh, last Tuesday's workshop. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'd like to start with a thank you. Uh, first, a specific thank you to the field sanitary sewer operators that are out there protecting the sanitation conditions for all of us citizens here in California. I'd also like to provide a broader thank you to everyone that is dedicating time to work with water board staff in developing this proposed order reissuance. Next slide. The purpose of today's workshop is for us to jointly discuss the informal staff draft order that's dated February of this year. And it is currently posted on our State Water Board website. It's important to note that the existing orders are in place and effective until the effective date of a future board adopted reissuance. Therefore, the 2006 statewide general waste discharge requirements and the 2013 monitoring and reporting program order um, are still in place and effective. Next slide. All right, during today's overview of the informal draft order, I'll be walking through the document itself. Um, I'll be providing our staff intention of the informally drafted requirements and the background. I'll explain the organization of the informal draft order. Um, I'll point out some of the new elements. And then I'll share kind of through commentary some of the informal discussions we've uh, had and some comments we've heard uh, from interested parties so far. Uh, this presentation has been crafted to address as many questions and comments that we have already received. Next slide, thank you. Um, there are several main objectives for why we're reissuing the existing order. The first is to update uh, the 15 year old order. But the second is to clarify the compliance expectations and to enhance enforceability. We also want to clarify that the enrollee must implement an effective updated sewer system management plan. Um, and with that, uh, we want to address system resiliency at the system specific level. We also as staff, um, have the duty to identify what data that is coming in through the existing order is valuable data and what data is no longer needed so that as we do reissue an order, we eliminate any non-valuable reporting that is in the existing order. And lastly, but not, um, but not least, um, is that we do want to incentivize operator certification. Next slide. Before I start the bulk of this presentation, um, there's some important notes. Uh, first, this informal staff draft is subject to change with further order development. Therefore, nothing you see in this document is set in stone. The order format has changed from the 2006 order. Uh, this format is consistent with current water board statewide orders. I'll be referring to the main portion of the order and the attachments. Both the main portion and the attachments uh, collectively are meant to be one enforceable order. And this order, as we've previously mentioned during discussions, is not a permit. Um, so therefore, please excuse if we unintentionally use the term permit when we refer to this document. We are maintaining one version of an informal draft um, as we collect the informal feedback um, during this stage of order development. 
And then there's some clarifications I'd like to make um, as uh, we've heard folks share some common concerns, um, which may be a misunderstanding. Uh, in this informal draft, we have no proposed requirements for enrollees to rewrite their existing sewer system management plan. Um, we have no requirements uh, to develop a formal asset management plan. And we have no requirements for enrollees to implement more capital improvement projects beyond their local budget. Next slide. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the organization of the main portion of the order. Um, this document starts with section one titled introduction. Then it goes on with section two titled regulatory coverage and application requirements. Then we have section three, which is titled findings. This, um, this is a pretty substantial section. The uh, findings are intended to include the factual basis that the state water board finds when they are going through, um, when they are actually taking an action to adopt this order. So then after the findings, um, that section uh, is proceeded with, excuse me, is continued on with a key paragraph. And that paragraph starts with the phrase, it is hereby ordered. So, that's basically the state water board making the statement during the adoption of uh, the order that they hereby order, and then in accordance with legal reference to the water code throughout that paragraph, that the enrollee shall comply with the requirements of this order. So therefore, all the uh, text after this paragraph makes up the requirements of the order. So, um, so then the document continues with section four titled spill prohibitions, uh, section five titled specifications. And this section, um, section five is another pretty bulky section. And this section is intended to include the requirements that are specifically placed on the enrollee. And then we have section six titled provisions. And the provisions include the basis uh, and the legal references for existing enforcement authority of the water boards. Uh, this section also lists out the different factors that a regional water board considers uh, as they use their own discretion for enforcement actions, um, and then several other items. Next slide. Okay, so here is the organization of the attachments. Um, we have attachment A titled definitions. Attachment B titled application for enrollment form. Attachment C, which is the notification of termination. Attachment D, um, which is a very important attachment here, which is titled sewer system management plan required elements. Attachment E is broken up in two parts. Um, the first part, part E1, holds all the notification, monitoring, reporting, and record keeping requirements. This is basically the proposed replacement for the 2013 monitoring reporting program order. The second portion of this attachment E2 is a summary of the requirements in E1 per spill category or spill type. The last attachment is attachment F which is titled Official Regional Water Board Contact Information for Required Notifications. Okay, so the first two pages of this order um, addresses the applicability of this order. This is a snapshot of um, the contents of the first pages. I will not be going over it. Uh, 
Our intention of including the key definitions for the purpose of this order uh, in the first two pages is so that anyone can basically pick up or uh, log or just download or whatever we do these days, um, this order. And after looking at the first two pages can make the determination if this order applies to them. Um, therefore, a person does not have to go into the order and read into several pages before they can determine if this order applies to them. Next slide, please. During this proposed reissuance, um, as staff, we are clarifying that this order serves as waste discharge requirements and waste discharge requirements protect waters of the state. So the informal draft emphasizes the protection of waters of the state, which include surface waters and groundwater. Section three, which is titled the findings, uh, includes the list of the many beneficial uses to be protected uh, for our uh, waters of the state. And it does include the protection of surface and groundwater drinking supplies, excuse me, surface and groundwater drinking water supplies. That's a key, actually that's a key class uh, clarification because uh, we are protecting are receiving waters as they are sources of drinking water. They are not the actual drinking water. Next slide, please. So what I'm actually leading into now is um, a new uh, proposal here with this reissuance, which is the proposed regulation of exfiltration. And we know this is a very sensitive issue to many interested parties. Um, and our uh, first two pages, in fact, I believe this is page two, um, defines spill uh, differently from the 2006 order. I won't read everything here, um, but I will point out that a spill now includes a release from um, a release of sewage from a system and a spill includes underground exfiltration of sewage from the system through cracks in pipes, misaligned joints, seepage through porous material or other means um, of a discharge to groundwater, a discharge to the ground surface or a discharge to surface waters of the state. Um, it, there's a footnote number one that is key here. Um, the sewage that is exfiltrated from a system that does not reach groundwater is not regulated by this order. So, um, so what we mean is that any sewage that leaves the system underground if it's contained within the trench or if it's contained within the surrounding uh, soil matrix and it does not make its way to groundwater or up to the ground surface is not within the scope of this order. Um, so that is key and I'm sure we're going to receive a lot of comments on this topic. Next slide, please. So now I'll go into more detail um, of the individual sections. The first section, the introduction section, provides introductory text of the State Water Board's intent of updating the existing order by implementing current regulations, policies, and resolutions. Um, also, this uh, section provides the State Water Board's intent excuse me, the State Water Board's compliance expectations for enrollees to proactively prevent spills and eliminate discharges to implement an effective updated sewer system management plan and to track and improve their own sewer system performance. Next slide, please. Section two is titled Regulatory Coverage and Application Requirements 
And this section um, is basically the administrative uh, procedures for enrollment under this order. We currently have over 1,100 enrollees in the existing order. We do not want over 1,000 um, full applications to continue enrollment from an existing order to a new order. Therefore, this section implements a streamlined electronic acceptance procedure um, through CWIX, which is our statewide database for continuation of existing coverage for existing enrollees to obtain regulatory coverage under the new order. Um, then also this section provides the administrative procedures for new applicants and for transfer of regulatory coverage from an existing enrollee to a new uh, applicant or new enrollee. Next slide, please. Section three is uh, titled findings. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of text in this section. This section provides the factual basis and the context for the order, including existing legal authorities through federal and state regulation, sewage spill threats to public health and state, excuse me, and beneficial uses of our receiving waters, applicable water quality control plans, which includes the Regional Water Board's Basin Plan, um, statewide policies, and state water board resolutions. Um, in the last uh, probably 10 years, um, we've had the state water board adopt new resolutions, yet we have resolutions that go back to um, actually 1968 that we are applying through this order. Um, just for example, we have, we're implementing the cost of compliance resolution in which um, the water board directs all program staff to, um, to identify the cost or the costly requirements of an order and to determine if those requirements are of value to protecting water quality or not. Um, we're also implementing our sources of drinking water resolution, um, which is a statewide um, policy to protect all sources of drinking water throughout California. Um, and another example is the Water Board's uh, resolution for response to climate change. These are just examples. In the findings section of the order, you will see the full list of all the uh, water quality control plans, policies, and resolutions we're implementing or proposing to implement through this order. And then lastly, for now, the findings um, also include information on existing funding and technical assistance programs that the State Water Board um, has and implements through um, our Division of Financial Assistance. Next slide, please. Section four is titled Prohibitions. Um, and this is probably uh, the key section in this order. It is somewhat different from the existing 2006 order. And the key difference is the very first prohibition, uh, 4.1, which includes that any spill of sewage from a sanitary sewer system is prohibited. The second prohibition reads any discharge of untreated or partially treated sewage of waters of the state is prohibited. And uh, the third prohibition reads any discharge of untreated or partially treated sewage that creates a nuisance as defined in the water code is prohibited. The uh, two last prohibitions um, are similar to uh, the current 2006 order. It's this first prohibition that is um, informally recommended to be added. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm taking a pause here. I'm not just diving straight into section five, which is titled specifications because um, this is a 
very uh, long section. Um, the specifications in the informal draft order are intended to be the requirements specifically placed on the enrollee. So I'll be going through uh, an overview of the uh, larger new informally drafted requirements. I will not have enough time to go through all the details. So this is a brief overview, yet we will definitely be answering questions and receiving comments um, on all portions of this section and the entire order. Next slide, please. So the first subsection I'll be going over is uh, section 5.3, which is titled Proactive System Resiliency. Um, this is our staff intent with uh, this proposed order. As we look at the 2006 order, we note where the board at that time included wording um, in its order that um, addressed proactive system resiliency. Uh, so specifically in finding three of the 2006 order, the existing text states, a proactive approach that requires enrollees to ensure a system-wide operation maintenance and management plan is in place will reduce the number and frequency of sanitary sewer overflows within the state. This approach will in turn decrease the risk to human health and the environment caused by sanitary sewer overflows. So our staff intention for where we address proactive system resiliency uh, is to build on and expand um, on this statement in the 2006 order. Um, there's a second finding uh, in the existing order, which is 13.4c, and that existing text reads, develop a rehabilitation and, re so it's an existing requirement, develop a rehabilitation and replacement plan to identify and prioritize system deficiencies and implement short-term and long-term rehabilitation actions to address each deficiency. So on this slide, uh, we went back and bolded some of those key words um, which we're building on, which are proactive, uh, decrease of risk, um, prioritize, and the distinction of uh, short-term and long-term rehabilitation actions. Next slide, please. Before I go further on with that, uh, we do want to acknowledge the success of the existing order, uh, which basically boils down to the success of many system owners in addressing uh, the number of spills and the volume of spills that um, were taking place from their systems. This is a graph um, that um, analyzed existing data in our CWIC statewide database. Um, from the year 2007 all the way up to 2019, which was the full year of data that we have. Um, and the orange line depicts the number of spills collectively throughout the state as shown in our CWIX data database um, th throughout the state, yes, collectively. And the blue line shows the total volume spilled for that year. Um, I'd like to note before I go on with the um, reading, how we read this graph, is that after the 2006 order was adopted, it took about a year or two to have enrollees, um, excuse me, to have systems enrolled in the um, enrollees to put in data and so forth. So as we look at this slide, I'm actually going to start with the year 2010. So in the last 10 years, um, we have seen the number of spills uh, dramatically decrease. 
from um, over 6,000 to, uh, to getting in the mid 2000s. So that is a good progress, especially since we see that decrease pretty steady. And that gives us confidence um, that there is a lot of work being done out there um, by system owners. A lot of proactive uh, work being done out there. Our concern continues um, when it comes to the total volume of sewage being spilled. So that's the blue line. Um, we do see decreases, then we see increases and we see decreases. Um, some of us will say that goes along the pattern of uh, wet years. Um, other folks says, uh, say not necessarily. Um, regardless, this order has been successful. When you look at the left side and the middle portion of this graph, when you look at the extreme right side, what it tells us is that we still do have spills taking place. We still do have considerable uh, volume of sewage um, being spilled. And, um, and so we do still have some work to do on a statewide basis, especially when it comes to urging um, all system owners to be proactive in preventing spills. Next slide, please. Therefore, continuing with section 5.3 when it comes to system resiliency, the specifications require the enrollee to include procedures in their next sewer system management plan update that address identifying high risk and high priority system and program areas. The specifications also require the implementation of updated risk and prioritization related corrective actions to prevent future spills. Section 5.3.1 limits the requirement for disadvantaged communities to a one-time plan update that includes risk and prioritization related procedures. Uh, we do want to take special, uh, make special consideration for our disadvantaged communities, acknowledging their extremely limited uh, local resources. The objective behind addressing proactive system resiliency in the way we're doing so is to continue reducing the statewide number of spills and the statewide total volume sewage spill through proactive measures that proactive enrollees um, have already been implementing. Next slide, please. Okay, section 5.5 um, of the specifications is titled Legally Responsible Officials. The current order requires an enrollee's legally responsible official to legally certify under penalty of perjury, it's regulatory coverage actions, meaning uh, the application for enrollment, transfers of enrollment, um, as well as termination. The legally responsible official is also uh, responsible to certify the sewer system management plan and uh, its updates and all individual spill reports. The specifications are modified to require the legally responsible official to have responsibility over operation and maintenance of the enrollee's entire sanitary sewer system and to hold a professional engineer registration or certified, excuse me, or certified collection system operator certification. Um, we have started hearing a lot of concern um, on this restricted, um, the restricted credentials uh, for the legally responsible official and we want to continue hearing any concerns you may have on this section. Next slide, please. Section 
6.10 of the specifications is titled System Performance Analysis. And this section requires the enrollee to track and annually report its own system uh, tenure performance through an analysis, which is basically a two line uh, graph. Uh, the first uh, line would demonstrate the annual number of spills. And the second line would demonstrate the annual volume spilled. This requirement is intended for uh, the enrollee to look at the current trends when it comes to their own performance and uh, acknowledge if they're doing a good job, if um, something needs to change um, or whatever needs uh, to take place. But our intention as staff is to put the responsibility on the enrollee. We have heard comments, um, why can't staff or anyone who wants to know this information go into the CWIGS database and do their own analysis? Um, that's not really our staff responsibility. Um, so this is one of uh, what we are proposing to be a state water board expectation on the enrollee uh, to be well aware of their own performance. Next slide, please. Section 5.14 of the specifications has a new requirement titled electronic boundary maps. This section requires submittal of uh, electronic, an electronic sewer service boundary map from each enrollee within 12 months of the adoption date of a new order or within six months of um, a new enrollment for, that has been approved for an applicant. Um, as part of this information, we want the public water system identification number and that is for the drinking water systems within that boundary. And we also want to include the waste discharge identification number, the WDID number of the treatment plant that treats the sewage in the collection system or collection systems in the boundary. Um, this information is, uh, is not uh, for our typical compliance determination. Uh, this information is for our own water board's collective identification of areas throughout our state that are not served by sewer systems. Um, and we want to use this information as our boards continue to address the interrelated drinking water and wastewater regulatory issues. Next slide, please. Section 515 and 516 address the notification of spills from private laterals or private systems. Uh, this, these sections require, excuse me, section 5.15 requires an enrollee to notify uh, the regional water board of any observed spills from privately owned laterals or systems of 1000 gallons or greater um, or a spill of any size that is discharging to a water of the state. Section 516 encourages the enrollee to notify the California Office of Emergency Services of any of these spills that have the potential to discharge to a water of the state. But section 5.16 also clarifies that it is the system owner's responsibility to contact uh, Cal OES. It is not the responsibility of any enrollee that does not own that system um, that observes the spill. So we do clarify, uh, we do make that clarification. The objective here is to have immediate attention on any spills that are current that are occurring out there um, that may be threatening our waters. Next slide, please. Okay, section 5.17 in the specifications is titled annual report. This section converts the existing questionnaire 
that is required or asked for in the 2006 order, uh, it converts that questionnaire to an annual report. Uh, a requirement for an annual report is consistent with other board orders for a compliance determination. Um, we do want to make sure we can minimize costs um, as much as feasible on our end. Uh, therefore, uh, staff is looking at the CWIX database and looking at the modifications needed to accommodate a proposed one-time entry of the report content, um, which a lot of it's already in there for enrollees that have been actively submitting their questionnaire. Um, and then an enrollee would solely go into CWIX uh, once a year and provide the annual update by uh, solely changing information uh, in regards to the changes that took place that uh, during that one reporting year. So we're here, we're trying to minimize the time and uh, the work for this annual report. Next slide, please. Um, the existing 2006 order categorizes spills in three categories, category one, two, and three. Uh, section 5.13 of the specifications uh, clarifies the categories and also includes a fourth category. Uh, category one um, is all spills to a water of the United States. Category two is uh, spills of 1000 gallons or greater that do not reach a water of the US, which we term is not a category one. Category three um, has been changed which is spills uh, from 50 gallons to 999 gallons, so up to 1,000 gallons, which are not a category one spill. And then there's the new category four, uh, which is defined as spills less than 50 gallons that are not a category one spill. Um, that leads into the contents that we have in section 5.20. Uh, that section provides an incentive-based reduced reporting program. It, um, this section um, or what we're proposing allows an enrollee to maintain their records on spills less than 50 gallons um, on site. So, only, so basically only fulfilling the record keeping requirements, not submitting that data um, into CWIX after each spill. Um, we are using this as an incentive to promote operator certification and also as an incentive to promote and acknowledge um, better performing systems. And so to qualify for the reduced reporting, um, an enrollee must maintain less than two spills per 100 miles of system per year. Uh, must maintain their total individual spill volumes uh, to not exceed a thousand gallons, uh, to have no category one spills, and to have at least 50% of their field staff as certified operators. Um, we've already heard quite a bit of feedback on this section in that this criteria is quite strict and there's not very many um, enrollees that would be able to meet uh, all four of this criteria. This is definitely a section that uh, we wanna consider uh, seriously the feedback we get as we want this to be a, a fairly strong incentive uh, within this order. Next slide, please. Okay. So, I'm done with section um, five, which is specifications, on to section six, which um, is titled provisions. The provisions are the legal, uh, contains the legal reference and the information addressing implementation of the order. Next slide, please. Section 
this section provides the legal reference for the existing water board enforcement authority. Um, therefore, if you go in there, you read and um, it's pretty educational in fact. Um, you can read about the authority that is granted to the state and regional water boards based on the California Water Code, including the Porter Cologne Act. So that is a state regulation. Um, this section also explains the authority through the Clean Water Act, which, are, which is the federal regulation for protection of waters of the United States. This section also provides information on the existing regional water board enforcement discretion factors. So this is the list of items that the regional board staff um, currently evaluate when determining um, what level of discretion their board should use for any identified enforcement issues and potential enforcement actions. This section also provides information regarding uh, the Regional Water Board Authority to order more stringent requirements on an enrollee or within their own region um, that are more stringent than this statewide order. Next slide, please. So that's uh, the end of my overview for the main portion of the order. And now I'll be going into the attachments. Uh, the first three attachments are attachment A, B, and C. Attachment A includes definitions that defines the key terms for the purpose of clarification and compliance consistency. Attachment B uh, is the addresses the application for enrollment and is the application form and the procedures for new applicants. And attachment C includes the notice of termination form and this is the form used to terminate coverage for an enrollee to terminate their coverage um, under this order. Next slide. Now I'll start with attachment D. Uh, which is titled Sewer System Management Plan Required Elements. Uh, this again is another section that um, is key. It's a very uh, thick section and there's probably a lot of important items that uh, system owners as well as other interested parties uh, will probably want to dive into the detail and look at this attachment. Attachment D provides the details to clarify the water board compliance expectations uh, for a sewer system management plan. The attachment includes the required elements to be addressed in the, an individual plan. And it defines the plan as a living planning document that documents the local program elements and procedures, the local decision-making protocols, system resiliency assessments and prioritized remediation actions, and the enrollees procedures for, con uh, for continuous plan updates. Next slide, please. This attachment starts with an introductory paragraph that explains if an existing plan already includes any of the new required elements, the enrollee is in compliance with that plan, with those plan requirements. Therefore, this again is what we were stating. There is no requirement to rewrite an existing plan, to change the format, to change the organization. Um, so an enrollee, basically, if you already have any new elements in your existing plan, you're in compliance. You could just check that off. Um, this attachment and the introduction also states that if any of the required elements are not applicable to a specific system or, your, or the specific enrollee, uh, the plan simply needs to explain why that element is not applicable. Again, there's no requirement to rewrite or reorganize um, the plans. 
Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, subsection 4.2 in attachment D is titled Interagency Coordination and Collaboration. This section requires established protocol for coordination and collaboration with local stormwater agencies to have coordinated spill emergency response and cleanup um, before spills are actually happening, to have that established already in the plan and to have the staff trained. Um, this section also requires uh, the established collaboration with local drinking water agencies for planned protection of surface and groundwater intakes from sewer spills. And so this is basically identifying any areas of the sanitary sewer system that um, is in close proximity to a groundwater or surface water intake uh, facility um, and to make sure that is identified as an area that needs attention uh, because that is a high consequence if there is a spill and that sewage enters that drinking water source. Next slide, please. Section seven of attachment D addresses system resiliency. As previously stated, um, our intention as staff is to build on the existing order uh, to address resiliency for um, the sewer infrastructure. The first two sections in the informal slide, uh, section 7.1 and 7.2, address condition assessment and capacity assessment. Um, here, what we did was we took the existing language in the 2006 and we clarified that language per uh, compliance expectations. Um, we have heard some folks say that we are using the word clarify yet we've expanded um, those requirements. Uh, yes, we have expanded those requirements. Uh, the way we look at it is to clarify what's expected. Um, we are definitely open to hear feedback on, on this. Um, the next subsection is section 7.3, which addresses risk assessment. Uh, this is new and it builds on that exists on that word of um, reducing that phrase reducing risk in the 2006 order. This section requires procedures to be included in the plan for assessing risk of system deficiencies that are identified in the condition and capacity assessment. So again, when I say plan here, I mean the sewer system management plan. We are not referring to the development of any additional system resiliency plans. Section 7.4 then follows the risk assessment section and it's titled remedial prioritization. This section requires procedures for the prioritization of short-term and long-term remediation actions addressing the higher risk system and program areas identified in the risk assessment. Then the following section is section 7.5 titled system resiliency actions. And this section requires incorporation of the resulting prioritization um, areas. And this, um, excuse me, I had a chat box flash up. Um, that requires incorporation of the resulting prioritization into the existing operation maintenance procedures and uh, that priority to be implemented um, through the order in which the capital improvement projects proceed um, to make sure that the um, high risk system elements are addressed first. Next slide, please. Section 11 on attachment D um, is titled Local System Program Budget and Resources. Then this section, um, this section requires a detailed description of the local resources dedicated to the sanitary sewer system and the local program. 
it also requires a description of the resources needed to implement the updated sewer system management plan um, and for the enrollee to operate an effective local uh, program to implement an elective, excuse me, an effective program. Um, this section also requires a description of the local program's accounting mechanism and procedures, um, a description of the auditing procedures that evaluate the revenues and the expenditures and the financial and accounting program procedures. Um, I want to state that we have heard a lot of very good feedback when it comes to the budgeting related requirements. In our current informal draft, um, we do have uh, the requirements that the budget has to look into uh, has to look into 20 years uh, in the future. Um, we have been educated that that is not practical. That is not how budgets um, are determined um, out there locally, and that uh, the feedback we're getting so far is that the right frame, the right time frame may be three to five years, five to seven years, five to 10 years and so forth. We're, we're definitely open to hearing more input um, on, on this topic. Next slide, please. The last section I'll be going over in, uh, for attachment D is section 16, adaptive management. This section requires the sewer system management plan to have a detailed narrative of how the plan has been updated to reflect ongoing system resiliency through the system and program modifications um, that are proposed to be made. Next slide. Now I'll be giving a quick overview of attachment E1 which is titled Notification, Monitoring, Reporting, and Record Keeping Requirements. Um, this is the portion of the order that updates the existing order and specifically the 2013 Monitoring and Reporting uh, Program Order. During this staff presentation, I'll be going over just our distinction of terms um, there's a lot of information in this attachment, a lot of details, and this is also an area that we know we will be further refining as we continue developing this order. Um, we use the, we define the term notification and the requirements uh, for notification, meaning uh, the notifying of the California Office of Emergency Services, um, and or the regional water boards of a spill. Um, monitoring means the gathering of information. We've organized monitoring requirements in three categories. One is visual observations, which includes photographs. This is also where the estimation of spill volume um, is included as a uh, visual observation and gathering information visually. Um, field monitoring is meant to, being, uh, to be the gathering of information using handheld meters. And then we have the water quality sampling with the laboratory analysis. Uh, we know that's very expensive and that uh, remains as being the same requirements in the 2000, well, the same trigger as in the 2006 order, which is for spills greater than 50,000 gallons to a water of the United States. Um, they're not the same requirements as the existing order as um, they're updated per uh, current federal and state uh, regulation and policy that addresses um, data quality and also implements our new environmental laboratory accreditation program requirements and regulations uh, through the state water board. And this attachment also includes all the reporting requirements and that's the reporting of information to the water boards, uh, which includes the reporting of monitoring results, plans, um, and reports, whether they're um, 
like annual reports or reports of individual spills. And then lastly, the requirements for record keeping, which means the maintaining of information in the enrollee's possession. And this information um, as currently required must be made available for uh, any request of a water board staff. Next slide, please. The second part of attachment E also addresses notification, monitoring, reporting, and record keeping. And this is a summary of those requirements in attachment E1 um, placed in tables per spill categories or spill types. So the first three tables um, basically tabulates the requirements and provides reference to the corresponding section in uh, attachment E1. Um, the first table is for category one spills. The second table is for category two spills. Uh, the third table is for category three and four spills. Then we have a table just once again, going over the requirements uh, for, uh, pri for spills uh, observed from private laterals or private system. And then the last table is uh, for the record keeping of spills less than 50 gallons in which an enrollee has approval to keep that information on site and not have to report that through the CWIX database after each spill. Next slide, please. The last attachment is attachment F, uh, regional water board contacts. Here is where we are intending to formalize um, the regional board office email address in which all required notifications uh, need to be submitted um, as required uh, when a regional board needs to be notified. Um, we're trying to eliminate here any um, voicemails left on a staff's a uh, telephone voice message over the weekend that hasn't been, um, hasn't been acknowledged or a, a staff having moved on and that's the staff contact that an enrollee is used to working with. So these are the official um, electronic email addresses for the official notification requirements. Next slide, please. This is basically the end of my staff presentation. I do want to end with um, our staff contact information um, as we continue the development of this order. Um, this is the contact information for the staff that are doing all the work. Afruz Farsimadan, um, she is our statewide permitting program manager. Uh, Walter Mobley, she is our lead project manager, and Steve Chung, he is our co-project manager. And uh, this is the way anyone can contact them through their email address. All right, so that, um, that's the end on um, this part for the staff presentation. I wanna thank you to listening to me. And Gert, back to you. All right. Thank you, Diana, for that lovely presentation. Um, we will now be taking a short break and then move on to the question and comment session uh, where folks will have the opportunity to ask questions and provide feedback. Uh, however, before we go on break, just a couple of reminders as we go into that comment, uh, questions and comment session that if you have any uh, questions or feedback that you wish to provide, please do so in the Zoom chat box. I see a lot of folks have already been doing that in the chat box, so thank you for that. Um, and when submitting your questions or feedback, please indicate whether you would like to ask your question or uh, provide feedback yourself, or if you would like State Water Board staff to read it on your behalf. And finally, when typing in your question or comment in the chat box, uh, please make sure that your Zoom profile displays your full name. I see some participants still have their name as iPhone or like a phone number. If you can kindly re rename yourself to your uh, first and last name, that would be uh, helpful for us in identifying uh, the individual comment. And then um, finally, if you have any technical issues with Zoom or the webcast, please send an email to sanitary sewer at waterboards.ca.gov and staff will work behind the scenes and um, addressing those technical issues.
And uh, with that, it is round 10-10. Um, we will take a 15-minute break and then resume after that. So uh, we'll come back around 10-25. Thank you. Alrighty, it is 1025. So welcome back everyone. Uh, hope everyone had a chance to get a quick stretch in or a glass of water. Uh, we will now be beginning the question and comment session of today's workshop. You're more than welcome to continue sending us your questions and we will try our best to answer as many as possible. Um, we recommend that if, if possible to limit your question or your comment to three minutes just so that we have enough time to get to a lot of the other participants. Uh, as seen from the chat box, we do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, as a reminder, instructions for submitting questions or for technical support with Zoom or the webcast are on this PowerPoint slide. And we will be taking a short 10 minute break um, around the 1130 mark, uh, just for a quick stretch break and then resume back with the question and comment session. Um, at this point, I will now turn it over to Afuz Farsimadat, who will be serving as today's question and comment uh, session moderator. Afuz, take it away. Thank you, Gorga, again. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Afruz Farsimadan. I, today, I will be monitoring the questions that comes in through the chat box, uh, read through the ones that um, ask for staff to read the questions, and we let people who wanted to speak um, to voice their comments. Um, on April 13th, we had a lot of uh, participants and we received a lot of comments. Unfortunately, we couldn't have time, we didn't have time to respond to all of the questions and listen to people who wanted to speak. So today I will start with uh, letting participants who couldn't speak last time uh, to comment first. And then I will read a couple of questions and then I will let more participants speak again. Um, Ella, is Travis Fisher um, joining us today? It looks Not like, here. yeah, there he is. I unmuted Travis, go ahead. Okay. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Travis, obviously, and uh, I'm currently at a small size sanitary district. Uh, we have four collection workers who are all grade three and four, uh, plus a supervisor. I'm also the incoming CWA Collections Committee Secretary, the CWA Tri-Counties Vice President, and currently the Senior Inspector at the Ojai Valley Sanitary. Uh, I'm here to today to talk about certification for collection workers. I believe that being certified helps create a more motivated, caring uh, collection worker gives you skin in the game or a type of buy-in. By having skin in the game, you care more about what you are doing. You pay attention to the details as you, as the more you learn, but the more you understand what is happening around you. Uh, I remember when I first started here at OVSD and the machines, equipment, and the regulations were a bit overwhelming at first, but I was mentored by our crew that was all certified with three or higher. I was being taught things the right way. Getting real answers for why we viewed this crack as a crack and not as a break, I learned that this is a, <clears throat> you learn different things from everybody. I learned that this is a highly specialized job that you will not have a true grasp of what you are doing in a few hours or even days, especially not in, a, in just a reading a book. These collection operators are operating machines that cost around a half a million dollars and can kill someone if they do not know what they're doing. This is not a normal public works job where my supervisor shows me how to start up a lawnmower and puts some PPE on me and tells me to mow this lawn. 
we drive these big combination trucks and clean and vacuum at the same time. We need to know the proper pressures to run them with the proper type of nozzle at the proper speed when we pull back and watch the flow to see what is coming out to make determinations about recleaning again or choosing a different type of nozzle. We need to know how to set up traffic control based on the speed and location of the manhole. We need to look out for safety for ourselves and others at the same time while vacuuming clean with loud noises. Cleaning a line can be very complex at times, as for CCTV of our sewer lines are just as complex, offering a $400,000 robot basically, assessing the condition of the sewer line in real time with over 200 different defect coatings, plus manhole inspection, and let's not forget about spills. Spills have so much going on from cleaning the blockage, traffic control, diverting the flow, investigating the cause, cleanup, estimating and the amount of spill and reporting. The state requires certification for so many jobs in the state from real estate agents who, didn't, who do an open book study test and then show up to take a, a test and are now, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, who show up to take a test from the state asking what type of roof line this is and other basic questions. Uh, barbers are licensed and inspected for steriliz steriliz ugh, sterilization to protect the public from disease. Yet here we are working with large amounts of raw sewage every day, trying to ensure that we do a better job at preventing spills and we're having a debate about being certified. Being certified makes standards that can move from one agency to the other. Recently, we hired a new employee being a grade four. We knew that we were going to get someone who is highly skilled and follows the same standards as our agency. I understand this would be a big cost to the state to issue out these certs. And I think that the CWA has a great system already in place. And I also know uh, the American Public Works Association has in other states the collections uh, does some collections certifications and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Travis, this is Diana Messina. Um, uh, I want to specifically thank you for your comments. Uh, not only they were very detailed, but they provided some uh, really important examples. And uh, with your comment, you're, you're truly exposing what it takes to operate, and especially the, the expertise that certified operators have. And with that, I wanted to just use your comment as one of the reasons why we are trying to reinforce certification in this order. So um, thank you for the detail and for the examples. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thanks, Diana. Ella, would you please unmute Paul Sykes? Paul sites should be on now. Hi, Paul. You're on. He's muted. Okay. Paul, you're unmuted now. If you would like to speak, you can go ahead. Paul may have technical issues, so let's unmute Kevin Street. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Kevin. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the board staff for their efforts uh, to include enrollees in this process thus far and share my hope that uh, the, the the open and receptive communication we've had up to this point continues forward. So thank you very much for that. Um, I wanted to bring in particular your attention to section, the language in section 5.4, where it talks about how local resources for full implementation of the sewer system management plan, um, it's a, the enrollees governing board shall approve the SSMP in its entirety and provide the necessary staffing, contractor, and budget resources for full implementation of the SSMP. I wanted to make mention of the fact that many cities and counties may be implementing multiple permits related to water quality. For example, in the city of Riverside, and I apologize, I should step back. 
I'm uh, with the city of Riverside and I'm the field operations manager overseeing our uh, 800 mile sewer collection system. I wanted to make mention of the fact that many cities and counties are implementing multiple permits that are related to water quality. Uh, for us, we have this WDR, we have our NPDES permits for our MS4 system and discharge permits for our wastewater treatment plant. And many of those programs are competing for the same limited pool of resources at, coming from the same funding sources that we use to implement these various programs. As I would assume the state board itself appreciates, our councils and boards like to reserve for themselves the right to decide how these limited resources are allocated across these competing programs, which are of equal importance and manage their programs as needed to maintain uh, compliance with these various permits. Uh, by specifically requiring that the governing board shall allocate all necessary resources for full implementation, there seems to be a suggestion that staff proposal would give the WDR priority over these other equally important programs, which exist for the protection and benefit of water quality. I also want to touch on the sewer system resiliency requirements in the SSMP. In particular, and as proposed, the iterative risk evaluation and management process and the need to incorporate how the outcomes of these would inform aspects of the SSMP would most certainly require an entire rewrite of our existing sewer system management plan. Furthermore, undertaking these efforts and those prescribed in the proposed elements would be well beyond our current funding capabilities, which up to now have been sufficient uh, in effectively managing our system. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. And next, Mike Dunbar. I'm not sure if it's the same Mike online. We have just Mike with no last name. So I'll go ahead and unmute if that is Mike Dunbar. Mike, would, would you like to speak? Okay, let's move to Craig Murray. M-U-R-R-A-Y. Caroline Ballas. Okay. I think Craig had a comment for staff to read. I will read it after I let everybody who uh, couldn't speak from last workshop to speak up. Um, Red Oyama. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi Ed. Uh, good morning, um, my name is Edward Oyama. I'm the uh, Director of Engineering and Operations for our West Valley Sanitation District. Um, I, I very much appreciate that the uh, State Board is providing this opportunity to discuss the uh, informal staff draft of the general order uh, and to receive our input. Uh, many of the participants in this workshop currently represent or have retired from the, what I'd consider the best of the best agencies in the state and often serve as uh, subject matter experts in their field. Um, so it's with this type of collaboration between us and the, the board that a final document can be fine tuned and provide an effective and workable regulatory measures for the wide range of collection system agencies in California and to achieve the goals of the state board. Um, I am happy to hear that the state board, uh, uh, as mentioned in the last workshop, uh, is willing to hold uh, future uh, stakeholder meetings to allow adequate time to discuss the details of the general order. As you heard, uh, on Tuesday and we'll hear again today, there are so many details 
that need to be discussed. Um, and uh, these particular sessions, although you know they're four hours each, there's 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 so many things to talk about in further detail that these the future uh, stakeholder meetings will allow that to happen. And so I'm hoping that the the stakeholder meetings um, will be um, uh, adequate uh, to be able to discuss all these things um, with the uh, representatives of, of uh, the collection system agencies. Um, it appeared, uh, appears from the, our last meeting that uh, a, a lot of the focus of these changes um, may be directed toward uh, maybe the smaller collection agencies as, to, as opposed to the ones represented here uh, uh, as participants in this workshop. Um, and, and maybe I got that wrong, but it was mentioned that there were there are quite a few number of smaller agencies. Uh, uh, I recall something like 25 miles or less that were the larger contributors of the number of SSOs um, and maybe uh, more difficulty in getting them in line. Um, if, if this is the case, then uh, it seems that it would be more prudent to address these smaller agencies uh, and not establish uh, more stringent regulations that blanket all collection agencies. Um, and certainly if, if the uh, changes are going to adversely impact how we operate our systems. Um, to me, in a way, uh, some of these stringent regulations and fines are um, almost akin to establishing harsher sentences for criminals in hopes that crime will be eliminated. It, it didn't work to curb crime and it won't necessarily work to get these small agencies to comply. So uh, I'm hoping for a uh, more uh, focused uh, approach. Um, like Paul Causey mentioned last time, uh, you know, this type of thing requires um, a scalpel, not, not a machete. Uh, so I'm hoping in the future discussions, there'll be time to, to talk about this. Um, uh, there is, there's a lot of mention about exfiltration in the orders. And um, uh, I know you realize this, but it, it really must be understood that this is a very sensitive matter for, for all of us because um, uh, most if not all collection system agencies has or will be sued by an NGO, uh, uh, in, at least in part for system exfiltration. So once it's officially in the general orders, whether you're saying, well, we're not gonna really uh, uh, um, enforce these things, we need to put it in there. That to me uh, gives the NGO uh, an avenue to uh, sue us and basically uh, require us to prove there is no exfiltration. In other words, they're asking us to prove a negative. So that puts us in a very difficult situation once it is officially in the orders. Um, uh, and the last thing I wanna say is, is um, I do have a, an issue with the LRO certification um, the LRO certification for SSOs, uh, to me, is, is substantially different than an LRO certification for the SSMP. So if you're talking about having a collection system uh, certification to uh, certify an SSO and an SSMP, uh, I don't believe that a uh, certified collection system operator uh, can really do that. And the reason why is because most collection system workers uh, do not have um, oversight over the work that goes into an SSMP. They don't oversee the consultants that are doing risk analysis. They don't have any control over any of that. So you're asking them to certify something that they can't really certify. Um, and uh, for the smaller agencies that don't have a PE, um, that creates, also creates a problem um, because uh, they don't have anybody on staff to do that. 
is it possible that uh, as far as the SSMP goes, uh, that that be assigned to whoever the manager of that agency is, uh, as opposed to a PE or a uh, collection system um, worker? Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Craig Morey has typed a question in the chat and would like staff to read it. So here is the question. Does the State Water Resources Control Board have to consider cost of compliance versus water quality improvement or cost impacts on very small agencies and disadvantaged communities? I know my small agency has invested heavily in our system we fully comply with the current order and our SSO frequency is near zero. Yet this very significant regulatory expansion will require us to hire new staff and raise rates for our customers. Wouldn't focused enforcement of the current order be more cost effective for all Californians? Bruce, should I go ahead and respond? Yeah. Okay, because I noticed we have uh, quite a bit of issues. So let's start with the comment that just was made um, regarding the small system. Um, and I didn't catch quite who made the comment, so I apologize for that. Craig um, Morey. Who? Craig Morey. Craig, okay, thank you, Craig. Um, what we're, what we're trying to capture here is um, an order in which the enrollees that are doing exactly that, they're effectively putting in the resources needed uh, to reduce the spills and comply with this order. So, uh, so Craig, your input is, is very important, thank you. Um, so that's, I, I just want to make sure that we communicate. That's what we're trying to capture. Um, cost of compliance is a very important issue here in California and to our water boards. We, um, the cost of the requirement does not hold us back from making, from recommending that requirement to our water board if the requirement is needed to protect water quality. However, our state water board, as well as the regional water boards, um, they're very attuned to not imposing requirements that uh, economically uh, or financially are not feasible. So there's, this is an art. Um, it's difficult on a statewide order to be able to make that evaluation. Um, but that is where our focus is for the cost of compliance. Um, I noticed we have a lot of other comments. Afruz, do you want me to hold or do you want me to start addressing some of the other comments? Sure, we have another comment from Caroline. It's the okay. same, um, she wrote, CASA has conservatively estimated the cost from $40, 40 to $80 million to comply with SSMP system resiliency requirements, attachment D section seven. This, this estimate doesn't include capital improvement from the resiliency planning efforts. We request greater flexibility for enrollees to identify and adapt to threats to resiliency. Okay, very good. So uh, since that comment is fresh and I have notes on the other comments, let me go ahead and address that comment. Um, this is where I believe we may be having a disconnect in communication. Um, and that is because here I'm hearing that it's gonna cost 40 to 80 million dollars to include procedures to strategize um, 
the local operation and maintenance program and the order of the implementation projects. Um, so we as staff are trying to clarify here that uh, what's in this informal order is not to add more capital improvement projects. It's for the enrollee to implement a strategy to identify um, what part of the system, um, if and when there's spills, uh, really will have uh, high consequences, high environmental consequences, high public health consequences. Um, so uh, our, our um, system resiliency requirements are not necessarily to add more work, it's to um, work smarter. And we've seen that and we've heard that from a lot of system owners that have reduced um, reduce their spills is actually looking into the operation and maintenance procedures, um, maybe going in and cleaning certain uh, areas of the system more frequently, um, doing the uh, video surveillance of certain areas um, before other areas, because if that system, if that portion of the system fails, the consequences of that spill um, are higher. And so that's where we would like more clarification on where the cost estimate of 40 to $80 million um, comes in. We do understand that uh, that's, uh, that's the cost of the actual capital improvements for a lot of systems. So we acknowledge that. Um, so if we can have more discussion on that, that would be great. I do want to um, clarify what Ed had mentioned is that um, we are working closely with CASA and CWEA and we'll be meeting with um, other environmental group uh, represented parties and so forth. Our future meetings will be targeted on um, different topics. We've already received a lot of informal feedback where we see certain sections, uh, certain entire sections of the order we need to relook at. Uh, we are continuing to discuss internally and planning to um, talk externally with you folks at further focused meetings. And we do have to be efficient because yes, there is um, a lot of topics here. Um, next, I'd like to address um, Kevin, uh, your comments, and Kevin's with the city of Riverside. Um, we understand that there are a lot of different sets of regulations and a lot of different uh, water quality permits on our enrollees. And so, as you mentioned, a big city can, and even a small city or a small municipality, um, can be under these WDRs for the sanitary sewer system, NPDES permits, and so forth. And um, we are not at all stating that a local board uh, needs to prioritize their local funds uh, for the sanitary sewer system over the funds necessary to comply with their NPDES, um, with their NPDES permit. What we are clarifying here is that uh, we do want to see the sewer system management plans that are developed and updated to be implemented, uh, which means that um, it is the enrollee's responsibility when they develop or they update their management plan to make sure what they're putting in there, that they're coordinating with their local board and uh, with their local budget to uh, assure that what they're planning to do, they can do it within their local budget. Uh, this is one, um, this is an issue basically with um, enforcement from our water boards that if we do see a system that is spilling a lot, um, and, you know, and there is more focus on that system. Um, 
A couple of the things that our enforcement staff will do is look at if the cause of those spills are addressed in your management plan. And uh, also, if it is addressed in your management plan, is the board giving you the resources uh, to actually implement uh, what's needed to address those spills? Um, if both those items are no, then um, there would need to be some kind of attention put on um, through the water boards, the regional water boards attention on that system to address the cause of the spills. Um, that of course is system specific and really specific and regional water board specific. So we can't make any blank, blanket statements, um, but the answer is no. We are not stating through this order um, how many, how much of the fixed resources any local board is to put on the sanitation system versus the treatment plan. Um, so to continue, um, I, I believe our staff would need a little bit more education on why the um, incorporate, incorporation of looking at um, high risk portions of a system and prioritizing um, any updates to your SSMP uh, would mean needing to rewrite the uh, sewer system management plan because that is not our intention. Um, and um, if there is anything in the order that does mean having to rewrite an entire plan, we would want to put more attention to that. In the last workshop, we did um, confirm from someone's question, can we just tack on additional attachments to our sewer system management plan? If that's how you update it, that's fine. But if, if it means you have to scrap an entire management program to incorporate strategically looking at high risk areas, um, there's something that we are miscommunicating in this informal draft. Um, Afruz, do you want me to keep going? <laughs> There's one more item I think is important and I may ask Brian Elder or uh, Russ Colby to address this one. And that is um, the comment that was made about, is it smaller collection systems that are causing uh, the issues and the problems out there? Um, Brian, do you, or Russ, would one of you like to address that comment? Um, this is, this is Brian Elder with the Office of Enforcement. And I mean, I don't necessarily have the data in front of me. I, I think the comment from last week had more to do with, uh, do, do smaller systems represent a larger percentage of the, of the, you know, 1100 or so systems that are out there. And I think that is accurate in terms of, of spills, uh, perhaps number of spills, but we're still seeing, you know, very significant volumes coming from. Um, as you might suspect, the larger um, interceptor type systems, um, those systems that have a significant number of force mains or pump stations. Uh, so I, I don't know that, that the vast majority of spills are coming necessarily from smaller systems. I think based on our audits, we've seen uh, compliance with the WDR and, and reduction in spills uh, from various system sizes ac across the board. I, I don't I don't necessarily agree that uh, um, if you're a smaller system, you have um, a higher probability of spilling more or m more volume or, or more times. Uh, I, there's obviously inherent challenges in terms of funding uh, and, and resources for smaller systems, but uh, um, I'm not sure I would characterize it that way without uh, really digging into the, to the data. Thank you uh, for responding to that. So Afruz, lastly, I just want to respond to um, the last one on my list before we move on, um, or maybe two. The first is um, thank you, Ed, about your comment on exfiltration. Um, that topic will definitely need uh, a lot of further discussion. We acknowledge that that's a hot topic. Um, I do want to address your comment regarding the legally responsible official and um, can there be 
a different individual that actually certifies the sewer system management plan versus the individual spills. Um, you know, that's an area that uh, we can further build on and then Rolly can have more than one legally responsible official um, if, if they want to. And maybe that's uh, an area that we can further develop this section. Um, we do though basically hold uh, continue to uphold the requirement that the legally responsible official needs to have uh, knowledge uh, and, and expertise and responsibility over the entire system. Um, because we don't want, like you had mentioned, an operator that just knows a certain part of the system to be in the position of uh, certifying a whole management plan or certifying um, any, any one of those larger elements that applies to the entire system and not an individual spill. So thank you for that comment. And we look forward to further attention um, on that section with, with further discussion. Thanks, Diana. I will start reading uh, some of the questions and comments that came in the chat box. Paul Kazi would like to invite us to <laughs> tour the San Bernardino Water Department sewer program facilities and program at our earliest convenience. Thanks, Paul. We always enjoy touring the facilities. And as soon as the COVID travel restrictions are lifted, we will probably contact you. Um, also, Paul has a question. What's considered to be a flow stoppage in definition of spill? Uh, and also, Paul mentioned that there is no well-defined pathway for compliance with the informal staff draft. Diana, would you like to comment on Paul's comments before I move to the next comment? Sure. Uh, sure. Um, so can you, can you repeat it again? Uh, Paul's question is what's considered to be a flow stoppage in definition of sphere? All right. So a flow stoppage, um, an example as we understand it is, or a couple examples, um, maybe tree roots going in and basically the tree roots become so massive, the, the solids in the sewage start accumulating in there and the flow cannot go through. So the flow starts backing up. Um, other stoppage wipes, um, et cetera. So basically we're definitely not providing anything specific, but um, uh, flow stoppage is anything that slows down or stops the flow, which actually causes flow then to go up and over and the system to overflow. And he mentioned that there is no well-defined pathway for compliance with the informal staff draft. There's no formal pathway. Okay, very good. Thank you for that overall comments to be further discussed. Um, we appreciate these large, broad comments. Um, what we really, though, can get our arms around to understanding and communication is uh, basically where the details are. But of course, that goes on with further, um, further work and development with this order. Okay. Lisa Moretti has a couple of comments that I will read them one by one. Um, the current approach of incorporating exfiltration into spills means that exfiltration requires the same reporting and monitoring as visual spills. However, there are significant differences between how exfiltration and spills are detected and addressed. Start time of exfiltration cannot be estimated and a volume estimate is going to be a wild guess. Also, how can it be determined if a leak has made it to groundwater without extensive evaluation? 
exfiltration will only be detected during observation of significant structural defects during CCTV inspections, or if there is evidence of leaching into a stormwater system slash waterway. The amount of resources that would be needed to investigate the potential for reaching groundwater and the volume of discharge would take resources away from the ability to actually fix issues. Comment number two is, as an agency that provides drinking water, stormwater, and sanitary sewer services, we understand the State Water Board's goal of protecting groundwater supplies. To protect groundwater from potential sewer exfiltration, a better place to start may be in the SSMP's resiliency plan. The proposed informal order already includes evaluating areas where leaks to groundwater are of particular concern. For example, high groundwater or nearby drinking water wells. This is a good proactive approach rather than the current exfiltration emphasis on documentation and reporting which will divert resources from the problem. Mm -hmm. Lisa's uh, third comment is, we understand that the Water Board wants to establish enforceable standards, but not provide prescriptive requirements. We would hope that organizations like CWEA and CASA could help provide guidance on, that SSMPs should, on what SSMPs should contain but this level of prescriptiveness is not needed in an order. For smaller, especially disadvantaged communities, you would want time for sewer professional organizations to develop templates that can be distributed. Please consider that these take time to develop, get stakeholder feedback and distribute. Mm -hmm. Lisa also has a question. OES reporting currently pushes out notifications to the regional board and to drinking water purveyors. What's the goal of also reporting to civics initially? Okay. All right, very good. Thank you, Lisa, um, for sharing all that. Um, I'd like to start with your comment on exfiltration. Um, and together with your suggestion about another avenue is to address exfiltration in the sewer system management plan. Um, that's a very good comment. Um, and we have heard that comment already and we started discussing the ins and outs of um, Another option is to incorporate exfiltration instead of as a spill as um, a focus on the sewer system management plan. Um, if it's identified through a condition assessment that there may be sewage exfiltrating out of the system. Um, so thank you. It's good to hear that comment once again. Um, for everyone listening in, um, Starting to consider the regulation of exfiltration is huge. Uh, and so as staff, we have put out there um, what it would look like if exfiltration is regulated directly as a spill. And I cannot emphasize enough that um, we put out an informal draft uh, so we can continue having conversations and actually have something to see what, um, what certain regulations would look like. So we can discuss, is this feasible? Is this not feasible? Do we need to take this out? Um, is, is this a good requirement to keep in as we further develop this? Um, so with that, um, on the exfiltration, determining compliance, um, is a little different and our intention isn't for a lot of costly monitoring and so forth. Our intention for putting exfiltration in that reaches groundwater 
um, or other surface waters in as a spill is so uh, is kind of twofold. Um, first, it's so that the actual discharge is regulated. Um, if that discharge does end up in an MS4 or in groundwater, and when it is detected, then that um, there is backtracking um, to the source of that exfiltrated sewage, and there is an order that actually addresses it. Um, the second is because we recognize, especially for the MS4 systems, that we, we regulate discharges from drinking water systems going into MS4s. We regulate um, discharges from utility vaults uh, when they're pumped out going into MS4s. Um, yet we don't regulate sewage and um, any of the sewage that exfiltrates and goes into the groundwater or so forth. So what I'm saying is that uh, this is a hot topic, we're working on it, and we will not be uh, recommending to our board anything that costs a lot of money when it comes to monitoring exfiltration. Our intention on that is to identify exfiltration through the condition assessment um, actions, and then also hindsight if, if and when sewage is found either um, in an MS4 or in groundwater. Um, the second um, item I want to address is um, the enforceable standards and working through CWEA and CASA on guidance. The State Water Board holds an ongoing uh, memorandum of agreement with the Clean Water Environment Association, uh, CWEA. Um, and it's CWEA that certifies uh, the operators. And uh, CWEA also holds the responsibility of providing ongoing training and workshops specifically for uh, the statewide regulations on sanitary sewers. Um, we work closely with CWEA and this is already on their, um, on their radar. Um, and we know as we work closely with Adam Link and Jared of CASA, that um, CASA is on board there also. Um, we do recognize that whenever there is an adoption of a new reissuance, whether it's for sanitary sewers or for any other um, discharges or um, facilities, that the effective date of the requirements um, does need to take into account how much time it takes to readjust and in this case, for example, with the resiliency uh, measures, we do put attention in the informal order on um, when a management plan needs to be updated with those resiliency requirements. Um, lastly, what's the purpose of reporting into CWIX? Um, for, for the spills from, um, from the, your own system, uh, the purpose is because that spill information um, is, is to be public information. Um, for for um, private spills, we're, we're putting a little bit more focus on that, on making sure that if the notification for an observed private spill, that the enrollee uh, does not own that system, um, if it goes into CWIX for that possibly not being um, publicly viewable simply because we don't want the entity reporting the spill to in any way publicly uh, seem to be affiliated with the cause of the spill. So we're putting more attention onto that. Uh, yes, we do recognize the Office of Emergency Services uh, does notify the regional boards um, Yet, as we work together with our regional board staff, uh, the requirements we're putting in the informal order for notification uh, to the regional boards is in areas where uh, they see they need to be notified directly from the enrollee. Did I cover everything at first? Yes, you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we have a comment from Marty Wilder. Um, his comment is, Private SSO reporting is often to the local county EHS office. 
While not an issue to include regional water quality control board, the problem remains that enrollees typically are not informa, informed of private SSOs. Many are in condo or mobile home park developments. Perhaps larger private developments such as these should mandatorily be enrolled to better account for private uh, sanitary sewer overflows. Marty also has a question. Is the state water board likely to make wastewater system certification a requirement as opposed to incentivize? Okay, um, good questions, Marty. And um, gosh, it's, it's really good to hear from you. Um, just so everyone knows, Marty and I went to college <laughs> together years ago. <laughs> okay, um, so let's start. In regards to the private spills, um, if, if a private spill is taking place on private property in a condo and so forth, um, we're not, that's not what we're addressing. Um, what we're addressing with the reporting of private spills is just if the eyes out there, if operators that are, at, that are out in the field see a spill taking place that is not from their own system and they can't do anything about it. In fact, they probably, uh, they may be even directed not to touch someone else's system. Um, just for it to be reported, for the observed spill to be reported. Uh, we simply want to stop sewage in its tracks out there before it makes its way to uh, to a water and poses water quality issues. That's why at this time we say any spills that appear to be a thousand gallons or greater uh, or are um, making their way into like an MS4 or um, another water of the state. Uh, when it comes to um, the mandatory reporting of private spills, um, oh gosh, a fruits, I lost track. I hope that addressed um, his comments. If not, let me know. Um, lastly, oh, I, I understand now my notes, sorry. Um, we, um, I, I don't know um, if there's folks in the audience that also attended a lot of our stakeholder outreach meetings back in 2019. Um, as we started with preliminary outreach, we asked the question, um, should the state water board uh, start regulating a privately owned systems? And with all that information, we realized that to start, we probably cannot get our arms around um, who, those, who owns those private systems. Um, as we started asking ourselves, well, where would the threshold be? Where do we draw the line? We don't want residences or we don't want individual homes. Uh, we started drawing the line, um, well, maybe we want like HOAs and trailer parks and um, private colleges um, and uh, you know those larger um, in commercial and industrial uh, laterals. And so we actually started drafting a requirement uh, for enrollees to submit their whole list of um, users that they provide service to that are these larger um, entities. And then we looked down and we thought, no, that's pretty costly. So where we decided the first kind of baby step that we would recommend to our board would be expanding this order to um, provide coverage for privately owned systems. So you'll see on the first two pages of the draft, when we are defining an enrollee, we have expanded that uh, to be a, owner of a, a private owner um, of a privately owned system. And, uh, and the language that we include is um, that uh, private owner um, if they're required by regional board to take coverage or to have regulatory coverage, here's the order to have regulatory coverage. 
um, we felt that was probably the best step to start capturing, um, enrolling and regulating private systems that we're observing spills. And that's very good with your comments. That's kind of how it ties in with us um, wanting to require enrollees to report private spills, because if there is a privately owned uh, larger lateral or a privately owned system that we're seeing spills, the regional board will most probably want to come in and require that private owner to take coverage under this order. All right, I think I addressed everything. You did, you did. I will read one more comment from an attendee and after that we can go back on letting attendees to speak. Um, Cheryl Hahn has this comment. Instead of incorporating exfiltration into the spill reporting categories, we would recommend that instead an annual report could require submetal of significant structural deficiencies from CCTV with potential to impact groundwater and a schedule of planned completed corrective actions. The current approach for exfiltration will likely result in small agencies not reporting anything because they will not have the expertise to determine whether exfiltration is occurring. While larger agencies will expend significant resources to address liability of being sued. And um, Cheryl's second comment is that the SSMP requirements are very detailed and prescriptive. We recommend a general discussion of a program's approach and procedures with detailed information available upon request. Attachment D, section 7.5 and section 9, prescriptive requirements for including schedules for funding, design, acquiring necessary resources, do not take in account the dynamic process that relies on many pieces fitting together. Section 2.5 states an exact budgeting timeline rather than allowing agencies to use their own agency budgeting processes. Okay, great. Um, first and foremost, I can see right now that our informal discussions are successful because I am hearing the development of different options on how to address exfiltration. Um, so I do want to say that, okay, we, we have what we put in the informal draft. We have what has been discussed and just recently commented on that exfiltration um, could be addressed through the SSMP system resiliency um, process. And now this option is another awesome comment. So thank you on exfiltration could also um, instead be addressed through reporting significant deficiencies found um, and that reporting being in the annual report. Um, thank you for everyone that is actually proposing options with the details. Um, that was very good input. Um, I, we realize that since a lot of folks are using the word prescriptive, um, we need to go back and make sure that the requirements for the uh, management plan is uh, clear that the requirement is for the enrollee to include its own procedures and that we do not um, impose what those procedures should be. Um, so thank you on voicing again the um, concern about um, items in attachment D being prescriptive. And lastly, with the SSMP budget, um, again, uh, we've heard that comment. Um, it's a good comment and um, we want to reflect how the corrective actions and the pursuit of resources when it comes to funding and all those items um, are needed. If it is too difficult um, at the time that you're updating your, uh, your management plan, 
uh, to include all that. In fact, if that information is not yet known, um, then we, we will need to uh, look at that and possibly pull out those, uh, those required elements for the SSMP. Thanks, Diana. Um, Ella, would you please unmute Jennifer Rojas? Hello, good morning. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Rojas and I'm the Director of Sewer and Water Field Operations for the Long Beach Water Department. First, I'd like to thank uh, the State Board for making this workshop available and to all the staff and to Diana Messina for um, having this discussion with, um, with the enrollees uh, this morning. So I would like to advocate for the inclusion of certification in the draft order. I'm in full support of certification such as that offered by um, CWEA as an alternative to being uh, registered as a professional engineer for the LRO. I'm also in full support of the inclusion of certified staff in the criteria for system specific reduced reporting. It is vital that those that work in the wastewater field have a certain level of minimum experience and knowledge. The certification process is a way to demonstrate and validate that knowledge and experience. It promotes consistency among all operators in the state and it increases the credibility of the workforce in that anyone who holds that level of certification has a minimum level of competency, no matter what specific agency they may work for. It provides a measurable standard for all certification holders. In addition, certifications increase the opportunities for uh, members of the workforce to advance their careers and it opens up other job possibilities. Those of us in the wastewater industry have important responsibilities to protect the health and safety of the public by preventing SSOs and mitigating the consequences of SSOs. The individuals in charge of this should have a definable, measurable, and consistent standard that verifies this. The inclusion of certifications on the draft order will serve to strengthen our industry in the long term, and that is why I'm in support of those portions of the order. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Afruz, I'm going to um, butt in here because I want to address this. And I realized there was one part of um, Marty Wilder's question that I didn't address, and it ties in with this. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you, Jennifer, um, for your comments. And we, we always want to ask our interested parties um, in addition to voicing what you don't like about what we put out there to also please voice what you do support because that, that is important communication for us. Um, what I do want to address is why this informal draft is incentivizing operator certification, uh, but not requiring it. And I think that's the part of the question I missed in the previous uh, comment or um, we actually entertained requiring operator certification. And as we went out and spoke to some agencies, um, we've learned that there is a huge component to requiring operator certification. And that is for the agency to have to work with the unions. Um, we did talk to a very large agency in which there, um, there um, personnel uh, worked for eight years to uh, work the unions that actually have the requirements for their operators to be certified. Um, they maintained this long-term goal that um, their board had decided it was worth that long-term investment of working with the unions, but it was very costly. Um, so for those of you in which we spoke with, especially through Jennifer and through her CASA subcommittee and Rachel Lather and so forth, in which we heard a lot of input that this order should require certification, uh, that is uh, where we stopped because we realized it would not be feasible. Even if it is feasible, it would be very costly. Um, 
Thank you, Jennifer, for um, your comments that uphold the credibility of operators out there because yes, the, our protection from sewage um, is something that a lot of um, a, a lot of individuals kind of take for granted, but it is a very detailed and credible field. All right, that's it. <laughs> Since we are on this subject, we have um, a question from JM0775. For the LRO, if one does not have a PE, but does have a CSM grade, what level grade will be acceptable to be an LRO? And Amanda Gray also asked, should an LRO have the authority to allocate resources necessary for compliance? All right, thank you, um, JM00 and Amanda. <laughs> um, you know, when, when it comes to our proposed requirement for the LRO to be a PE, we're hearing a lot of feedback on that. Um, so that is one area that um, we may be proposing to change. Uh, however, when it comes to the LRO uh, providing an option and the focus of one of those options as being a certified operator, um, that is one place where we are hearing this feedback, especially like Jennifer just provided on upholding the credibility. Um, we're working closely with the California Water Environment Association on uh, what grades um, actually incorporates the um, knowledge, the supervision knowledge, the overall system management knowledge. Um, we understand that there isn't one collection system um, certification. There's numerous certifications for different, you know, there's electrician, there's maintenance, there's different operators. Um, CWEA is educating us to where um, uh, we could actually be considering a grade two um, certified operator as they're pointing out to us the part, the part of their examination process uh, and expectations for the grade two operator. Um, so with that, at this time, we're not identifying any certain um, certification as long as that certification is applicable uh, for an operator to work on a sanitary sewer. Um, and, and that's our feedback in regarding to what level uh, we continue to consider. Okay, thanks. Gorgagan, is it our second break time or I can call on another attendee to speak? No, um, I think it would be a good segue now to go to our second break. So right now uh, we'll still continue with the question and comment session, um, but for now we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll resume around 11.41. And then the question and comment session will run until 1212. Oh, 1220. My apologies. Thank you. All right, welcome back from break. Uh, we will now continue with the question and comment session. Um, this will run until 1220, and which will then move on to the next steps of the order reissuance process. Um, due to the large volume of questions, uh, comments that we are receiving, uh, we will stay back after 1230 to, for an additional 30 minutes until one o'clock to answer uh, as many other uh, comments and questions we can fit in during that time. Additionally, for the folks viewing on webcast, the webcast will also be extended until 1 p.m. to for for folks to listen in. And with that, Rufus, take it away. I since we don't have enough time and we still have a lot of 
100 questions and comments. From now on, I will just read the comments. And if there is a question, uh, Diana will respond. Um, we have one comment from Debbie Webster has actually a question. Initially, a purpose of this revision was to describe staff's expectations. However, it was just mentioned that an enrollee could indicate that something was not applicable with a description of why. What's anticipated to occur if expectations are different? Uh, Debbie, I'm not sure if I understand your question completely. Um, would you please put in the chat some clarification? Thank you. And Robert Morishita has a few comments. Uh, the first comment is that Robert respectfully requests that the State Water Board staff be sensitive to increasing the liability to enrollees during the WDR update. For example, section 3.1.2, discharge of sewage includes facilities that serve those beneficial users, increasing civil liability to enrollees. In section 6.1.5, indirect discharges recommend change. Indirect discharges recommended change is that uh, to put does not inadvertently impact beneficial users to minimize as much as possible impact to beneficial users. Uh, Robin's uh, next comment is recommend removing the first bullet. It is not practical to ask for public input when program modifications are developed and implemented. Recommend removing bullets two and three um, in quotation. Timely notification regarding past spills and information on recent spills. The public can get the information from CVEX. Um, Robin also recommends removing the last two bullets and enrollees will be required to work with private owners and owners of satellite systems to be informed of local ordinances, private infrastructure maintenance responsibilities, source control outreach and sewer system improvement projects. Um, we have a comment from... Oh, Pruce, uh, before yeah. you move on, I see Debbie has her hand up. I think she wants to clarify her comment. So Debbie, oh. we will uh, unmute you so you can speak. Thank you. This is Debbie Webster with the Central Valley Clean Water Association. And so my question was, is early in the presentation and, and within there, one of the purposes was to clarify staff's expectation. Um, in in the WDR, yet there um, and yet it also was said that um, there was um, the ability to in, say that things were not applicable, but to describe the reasoning why they were not. And the question was: Is if there is a difference of opinion, how will that be resolved? Uh, Fruz, were you meaning to call on me before I put the video on? <laughs> Let me go ahead and, and answer that. Hi, Debbie, um, and thank you. Um, all right, so if there is a difference in opinion on if uh, one of the elements in attachment D are, um, are applicable to that specific system or that specific enrollee or not, that discussion is taken up with the regional board. Um, and so um, one of the things we're trying to do with the informal order is structure it and structure the electronic reporting in a manner that our regional board inspectors um, can do as much review as possible electronically and decide which facilities they need to go out um, to do detailed inspections. Um, for 
any question on if there's a deficiency in the management plan, if there's a deficiency in the local program um, that should be addressed, but not addressed in the SSMP, that's a discussion you'll have with your regional board um, or the Office of Enforcement staff that's assisting the regional board on any attention they're giving um, to an enrollee or to a system. Okay. Now I will call on Monica Oakley. Ella, would you please unmute Monica? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate um, your emphasis, Diana, um, um, that this is an informal draft and that you have flexibility for changes. And I also appreciate that the State Water Board is considering reduced reporting for very small sanitary sewer overflows, such as in section 5.20. Um, however, I'm concerned um, uh, about the incentive for at least two reasons. First, the current draft language creates such a high bar that it would actually create a disincentive because it would be demoralizing as almost no agency would ever reach it. And, and I think you've actually received that feedback um, before. Second, SSOs less than 50 gallons are typically encountered by agencies that own and maintain the lower lateral. These types of spills come out of cleanouts and are typically deposited on the ground. As you may know, only a fraction of municipal agencies currently own or maintain the lower lateral. But many of us, I think the state and perhaps many municipal agencies agree that it's actually desirable for municipal agencies to own and or maintain the lower lateral because agencies are more efficient at dealing with them and also behave responsibly for this work um, in comparison to individual property owners. Related to this, SSOs less than 50 gallons do not create a water quality problem or create a nuisance. Although it was stated on Tuesday that SSOs less than 50 gallons could create a nuisance, I would like to respectfully disagree. The definition of nuisance at California Water Code section 13050M is anything that is both injurious to health and affects an entire community or neighborhood. And SSOs less than 50 gallons do not do this. As indicated in the timeline graph showing a consistent decline in reduction of both the number and volume of SSOs over the last 12 years, as I mentioned on Tuesday, municipal agencies are working diligently to reduce their SSOs. Just like the State Water Board, municipal agencies want to protect the environment. Municipal agencies are not for-profit operations. They are working to protect water quality and the environment for their citizens because that's what the citizens of California want. I'm really concerned that you're going to create a disincentive for agencies to not own or maintain the lower lateral with this kind of um, approach. And taking all this information together, I'd like to suggest a simple solution that all reports of SSOs less than 50 gallons be kept on site only and not submitted to CWICs. These SSOs are not impactful and not worth the scarce public resources that both state and municipalities should instead be focusing on meaningful problems. This approach is also consistent with your goal of eliminating non-useful reporting that you mentioned early in your presentation. Thank you very much. We have two similar questions from Schroeder and Jason Lofton. Um, the question is on the definition of spill, including um, emission. Um, Jason asked, uh, the definition of spill includes any other type of emission. The word emission is concerning because the word is often used to describe sewer system odors. And Schroeder um, asks, what is meant by emission? Does it include odor, air, etc.? This is vague and adds confusion. Diana, would you like to address that? Uh, 
Um, yes, I'll address that. And um, Brian, you may also want to address this too, since I think you see a lot of this much more than I do. Uh, just our intent on the word emission is basically um, any sewage that is emitted out of the system. And this is where I'm gonna have to depend on um, one of our other staff that's out in the field more than I to expand on it, please. All right, I don't hear anyone. Um, so I, I hope I, uh, I've answered that question. The mission means emitting out. Um, Diana, this is Tim. I don't know if oh, you can good. hear good. Thank you, Tim, for popping in. <laughs> I, I think what we were driving at with emission, well, I know it, it was not in relation to odors or, or gases. It was, we're, we're, we're doing what we usually do, which is try to define something as broadly as possible. And emission is something, although mostly used in the airfield, the courts have referred to it as, as a type of discharge. Of, of wastewater. So we, we just wanted to throw every kind of term in there so there wasn't any kind of lack of clarity. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Um, Tim is um, our attorney on this project from our Office of Chief Counsel. And uh, with that distinction, um, when Tim says we want to be as broad as possible, um, that is that is part of our attempt to increase the enforceability um, as we are here trying to regulate uh, sewage that is um, that is out of the system. Okay, thank you. Before I move to the next comment, I would like to clarify that Robin Morishita's um, comments about removing the bullets were regarding SSMP required elements section 15, local agency and interagency communication. Our next question is from Schroeder. Why would we need 4.2 and 4.3 if staff is recommending 4.1? What's the difference or exclusion? And what gives the jurisdiction to add 4.1? Tim, would you please respond to this question? It's regarding the prohibition. Um, what we're trying to do there again was be as broad as we can. And we're considering um, the state board's anti-degradation policy and we're, we were really struggling with, you know, what is a, an acceptable, acceptable amount of raw sewage that could be, you know, released from a, from a collection system. And it was hard to really quantify that. I mean, it, the intent with, with, with WDRs for a treatment plant is that the sewage be conveyed to the treatment plant where it can be properly treated. And it seemed like a failure if it's, you know, discharging out of a manhole into, into the street or, or in, into someone's yard. Um, so it's, it's something that, you know, we're open to alternative uh, wording, but we are trying to get a little bit more broad than what we had in the 2006 order. Thanks, Dan. Our next question from Schroeder is, is asking what spills would end up on this graph? Category one, two, or three? Would this include lateral and main lines? Um, I think Schroeder is talking about slide 34 system performance analysis um, graph. We, we I, Diana can clarify this, but we, want to include all spills and all volumes per year for each system. Diana, you're on mute. God forbid no one can hear me. Um, you're correct, Afruz. Um, the, the graph there is for the spills that occur um, as defined in the order and 
as required to either be reported or um, kept as records. Another question is to what level of accuracy are enrollees required to determine the 1000 gallons for private spills? And to what extent are public systems ob obligated to report on privately owned systems? How do public systems recoup costs for efforts to report private spills? So Fruz, I, I get, or one of the reasons why there is some clumsiness here is that I don't know if you want me to answer this immediately, but for this one, I will. Um, so how precise should the estimation be of 1,000 gallons? Um, this actually overlaps with our reason why we want to encourage certified um, operators. Um, certified operators, a lot of, um, they have to keep up their education units to keep up the certification and, um, and CWEA and other uh, local um, education programs are putting more focus on helping teach how to estimate the volume of a spill. But of course the precision will only be as good as the estimation of the volume. And the eyes out there that are seeing the spill are the only eyes there that can truly uh, predict the volume. So we're not gonna be questioning that uh, unless there's other information that comes in. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks Schroeder for your questions. They were very informative. Um, now let's go back and call on another attendee to speak. Um, Steve Jepson, please. Ella, would you please unmute Steve Jepson? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hi, this is Steve Jepson from the Southern California Alliance of Publicly Owned Treatment Works, SCAP, speaking on behalf of our coalition, which includes CASA, BACWA, and CIVICWA, and SCAP, and um, we support all of the comments for, from our coalitions as well. And, and uh, Diana, I'm so impressed with your endurance and patience in answering all our questions and, and addressing our comments, and many of which are, are multiple times. And also um, uh, hats off to uh, Walter and Afruz for managing the questions. I know that's challenging. So there's the first part of the uh, management sandwich that I'm about to serve. Um, we have significant concerns with the exfiltration elements, as you know, and, and I want to restate uh, my comment from the first workshop. Um, exfiltration from a typical sewer to an MS4 or groundwater is still a theory. There have been documented cases where there's a severe defect that has leaked or cases of illegal chemical or debris dumping that have damaged a pipe and, and created a leak. But these are isolated and uncommon events. Uh, there are systems in place currently, such as CCTV and flow monitoring to identify and correct these events. No agencies wish to leave a significant defect unaddressed. The theory of system-wide chronic exfiltration affecting waters of the state is just that. It's a theory. The San Diego Regional Board has recently issued an investigative order to study the theory of exfiltration. The study is being conducted by the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. It's just getting started and it's a five-year study. SQUIRP um, has been open and inclusive with the wastewater agencies and SCAP, which we appreciate on their study. However, we have expressed some concerns with the approach, such as using potable water to test for leakage in a sewer instead of actual sewage. So the theory of exfiltration is nowhere ready or feasible for our regulation. You can't regulate or enforce theory. Prior to exfiltration being included 
in an order, we need to know that it's actually a problem and how to measure it. We need to wait for the San Diego Regional Study that includes exfiltration to be completed and peer reviewed and perhaps other studies as well to figure out how to measure it if it exists. So my next comment is a little bit more general and um, you know, we have seen the reduction in spills even during wet weather um, when considering uh, rainy season intensity. The 2006 order is working well. We understand that there are still some agencies that are not participating or performing as well as they should be. We don't see how the new order with all the little prescriptive requirements will improve that. We've heard repeatedly that regional boards struggle with resources to enforce the current order. How will that change with a new more prescriptive order? It seems like there's an implementation issue, not an order issue. It doesn't justify a massive rewrite. Most, perhaps all of the water boards stated goals could be accomplished with a minor tune-up of the existing order, and more importantly, some audits and engagement with the performing agencies. There are so many cost increasing actions occurring for sewer collection agencies currently. One example is the California Air Resources Board has an aggressive clean fleet, clean truck regulation that requires zero emission vehicles for public agencies. The major uh, sewer cleaning manuf truck manufacturing company has indicated they don't know how they will make these. Their estimates, if they could, would be these vehicles would cost three times as much and would have a limited, limited duration in their performance. So agencies are, are, are you know, we're seeking a carve out with CARB for um, sewer maintenance equipment, but agencies are facing these kinds of cost increases um, from other sources as well. So with, with all the new requirements and, and documentation as in the draft order, agencies are either gonna have to add staff or reduce time in the field. And finally, this is something we're, we're gonna work on together, um, but there are, are many words that need to be changed such as all, ensure, immediately, each, every component, um, and we welcome the opportunity to refine this language um, in whatever format the new order takes, whether it's a minor tune-up or an extensive rewrite, but we welcome the opportunity to refine the language to minimize the legal traps and still accomplish the water board's intentions. So thank you so much for um, allowing me to comment today and happy Friday. Thank you, Steve. Um, next, please unmute Jared Bosco. Hi, good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, hi, Jared. Hi, Afruz. Uh, and actually, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Jared Bosco, Manager of Regulatory Affairs for the California Association of Sanitation Agencies. CASA represents over 125 public agencies comprising over 90% of the sewer population for the state. Um, thank you again for this informative presentation. We've been lucky to hear it a few times now and it's helpful to understand how you're viewing this draft. We're appreciative of the informal staging of it and, we'll, and we're grateful for getting to meet with your team uh, at the end of last month and we're appreciative of the collaborative dialogue going forward. Uh, it's the clean water sector's perspective that the current SSSWDR is working and has dramatically reduced spill frequency and volume in California. Uh, sanitary sewer overflow incidences, or SSOs, they've decreased by 60% since 2008, and category one incidences, which are the ones that actually reach surface waters and may adversely impact water quality, uh, cat ones only comprise about 15% of the type of incidences in the CBIX database, and they've decreased by nearly two thirds since 2008. So there's a feeling of, uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it, and we've heard said, well, during wet weather, you know, spills uh, increase. And while that might be so relative to dry weather years, uh, when looking at those wet weather years from 2011, 17, and 19, SSO incidents are still decreasing in that time. So we have concerns with the narrative about 
what the CBIX data means and how it's being used to justify very sweeping and costly new requirements. As an example of requirements, uh, we've heard staff convey a few times that this informal draft does not require a rewrite of the SSMP. However, when going through attachment D and doing a word search for the term must, it's staggering what all enrollees would be obligated to do now. So, so maybe it's just semantics with the word rewrite, but certainly new composition is going to be required for enrollees to take their 2006 based SSMP to where this informal staff draft is calling the SSMP to go. Uh, as just a few examples uh, from section seven, the SSMP must provide procedures for assessing risk that at a minimum must incorporate condition assessment and capacity assessment info, must identify high risk system components and system areas that potentially cause or contribute to spills, must measure risk for potential spills due to increased infiltration and inflow, must measure inundations risk of low-lying pump stations. The risk assessment must include a ranking system that categorizes all system components, and the categorization must be based on the severity of the consequences of system spills. The sewer system management plan must provide procedures for the prioritization of short-term operation. The SSMP must provide procedures for the prioritization of long-term operations. The SSMP must include specific actions and corresponding schedules to immediately address resiliency for identified high-risk portions of the system. We previously estimated our members would have to expend 40 to $80 million conservatively to deliver just on the planning for the resiliency requirements of this informal draft version. That's for 1,200 enrollees to defensively perform the assessment, conduct an analysis, and generate the information and paperwork that's called for under these requirements. So I'll make two points and then we'll close. The first is with all these prescriptive requirements, it's going to expose local governments to third-party litigation under the mandatory duty doctrine, which one of the practicing attorneys here today could expound upon if need be. But it's discouraging to think that a bounty hunter type of approach to enforcement is where we are after all of our members' efforts over the last 15 years to keep driving SSO incidences down. Maybe that's not the intent, but with 125 must, 108 shalls, and 20 immediately's in the new draft, that is what's effectively rendered. The second point is, why are we changing horses in midstream in consideration of our members' ongoing investments, including amongst other things, their inspection and planning schedules for repair and replacement and inspection, to continue improving their systems and keeping the SSO rate decreasing. It feels like a machete of a change in the new policy, where in fact a scalpel is really is what's needed at this time with the mature WDR and the results it's bringing. Uh, as said elsewhere, we are curious whether the State Water Board staff has tried first a, a focused enforcement approach to those systems that are frequently appearing in the CBIX database. I've done my own review of the data, and when you look at SSOs above 50,000 gallons and compare it to the enforcement actions brought against them, the two columns are incommensurate. And so it leaves us wondering why the State Board is leaping ahead to this significant overhaul, which seemingly presumes all the enrollees are not fulfilling their duties, and they can only be held to account through a document that seems fitting more for an enrollee that's under a corrective action plan. Um, instead of expanding regional reporting needs and requirements to the statewide level where they may not be applicable or fit, we think a more narrowly tailored draft of the WDR would be appropriate, especially because there's nearly 1,200 enrollees. And of those, nearly 80% are small or very small systems. A very small system is less than 20 miles, and they're 50% of the enrollees. And a small system is between 20 and 100 miles, and they're 30% of the enrollees. So when we speak about all of these requirements and the cost of compliance, it can't be lost on whom the bulk of those costs are gonna be borne by. And they're the very small systems which aren't resource rich and they serve communities with real, restraint, real restraints on raising rates. So again, thank you for the collaborative dialogues and the conversations. We look forward to the future meetings we've been planning with your team and the other stakeholders in the coming months to discuss potential revisions to the informal staff draft, to move it to a place where mutually you're achieving your objectives and the regulated community is able to implement it without great expense. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. We definitely hear your concerns and we're gonna have subsequent focus meetings with CASA representatives to refine this draft, informal staff draft. Thank you. Next, I'm gonna call on Steve Cano. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi okay. Steve. 
Hi, my name is Steve Kana, and I'm the wastewater maintenance superintendent uh, for Costa Mesa Sanitary District. We're a small um, district with about 224 miles and 20 pump stations with a crew of six. Um, I'd like to also discuss the importance of being certified through CWA. I'll be brief because um, since Travis and Jennifer covered most of all the stuff with their great talking points. Uh, so here at CMSD, we do require our crew to have at least a grade one, and they have a year to get it. Um, just by having a, certi a certi certificate, it shows that they have the knowledge of sewer maintenance and mostly the safe and proper ways to run our equipment, which can be dangerous. Also, the community will be able to see that we do have the skills and knowledge, and it just increases our credibility. Uh, we, over here, we do encourage our crew to obtain higher grades because some of the upper positions require grade three and four. And also here at the CMSD, um, the higher grades they get, they also get incentives, which is um, an increase in their salary 1.5% for each grade. Um, so a lot of here take advantage of that. Um, so I do encourage um, certification here. That's all I have. Thanks. Great. Thank you. As Diana mentioned earlier, we will definitely um, take the certification issue seriously. Um, I know Nicole Grandquist had to leave, but if Nicole is still with us, would you please unmute her? Can you please repeat the last name? Last name? G-R-A-N-Q-U-I-S-T. Um, she is no longer in the meeting. Oh. Would you please unmute Andy Morrison? Okay, looks like uh, I'm up. So uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, valuable versus non-valuable reporting clarifications that really are confusing and improving enforceability. But uh, last time I spoke, I didn't really introduce myself. I'm assuming many people knew me, but I think that was a mistake. So just real quick, uh, a little background on me. Uh, for, I've been in the wastewater collection system industry for just about four decades in uh, both field experience, management experience. Uh, most of my career, I was at Union Sanitary District. I managed it very well for the last 10 years of my uh, career when I retired. But in the course of my career, I helped US EPA with uh, defining CMOM requirements. I was on the SSO guidance committee when we drafted the WDR. I was on the CWIX data review committee, the CWIX database for SSOs, and on the CWIX steering committee. And uh, I was involved heavily in the 2013 MRP update. I helped write uh, the discharger user guide that's on the CWIX database uh, site, rather. I've uh, been an author and a primary author on several best management practices. I helped uh, Bakwan Savikla when we wrote the SSMP guidance documents. I helped CWA uh, fulfill training requirements under the mutual expectation agreements. And I've done a ton of work with DKF training. Uh, solutions uh, on SSO drills, including teaching people how to determine start time and volume estimation and documentation. And I helped San Francisco come into compliance with overflow response and training. So I'm any old guy, all right? So the valuable versus non-valuable reporting is, that's great. I like that concept, but honestly, two hours notification for all spills is, is not value it. it's not it's going to be garbage cwix notification uh portal and oes having two different databases for notification is just asking for data errors and not useful information um, regarding clarification and expectations of, of uh, improving enforceability it's a great goal and, and this draft though has less clarity and it's likely going to be more difficult to enforce, not easier. Uh, again, with like notification to OES and CWIX uh, for all spills. And the concept of uh, the, uh, 
the definition of a uh, nuisance includes, and really it has three components. And one of them is that it's, uh, it was a result of treatment or disposal of waste and spills that are recovered are not disposable disposal of waste. And you're gonna get lost in the minutia of that argument. So we, we should be focusing on discharges, what we used to know as SSOs, which are gonna be now called spills, it sounds like. You add exfiltration, that's just a can of worms to try to enforce that or explain that, including private spills is gonna be more difficult. The fact that attachment E1 and E2 have uh, some, they don't agree, that's a problem. Some of the sampling rules contained in the draft don't agree within the draft. Uh, the, the, the requirement to inspect your entire system annually, just a ton of stuff where guys like me are gonna be uh, tasked with uh, a lot of untraining throughout the whole state. You know, you include five new SSMP elements, but you don't want them, call them elements, and, and you don't want people to revise their SSMP. Well, that needs to change and be more clear. Uh, the, the more categories, uh, private spills, so those things, notification changes, and then an agency may lose its qualification to not report a four. That's gonna be difficult to train and explain that you better start reporting your fours because you lost your qualification. I'm gonna tell you, years ago, I, part, I was part of providing training to US EPA inspectors, uh, state water board staff, regional staff, and contractors like Tetratech twice at, at our yard and USD and other agencies have done this too. And you heard earlier, Paul said, San Bernardino's offering come, come get some training. I, I think it's time to do this again because when I look at the content of this proposed draft, there seems to be, in my humble opinion, there's a lack of understanding of how collection systems are operated. I've helped in the past, I'm willing to help again before I completely retire from this industry and uh, just, you know, margaritas and maybe work in a hardware store. But for now, here's my last comment and my humble opinion. Our efforts to date have been and continue to be effective in reducing the number of SSOs and volume. And if you really wanna further reduce the number of SSOs and the volumes that reach waters, you need to increase the enforcement activity under the current order, like Steve alluded to. And like Jared said, there's a ton of SSOs that have not been on force that did reach water. Things like fines, jail time for those that are lying and they know it, prescriptive orders for those non-compliant enrollees, that sort of enforcement activity will cause the number and the volume to go down, not writing more complex, confusing orders. I I I'm sorry, uh, that's it, I'm done. Thank you, Andy. We always appreciate your input. So first, Diana, before we uh, start uh, to the next comment, we have time to squeak in one more question or comment, and then we got to move on to uh, the next steps, uh, the final steps of the um, workshop. So uh, next comment. Let's call on the last person who wanted to speak. Um, before we move on. Sergio Ramirez. Ella, would you please unmute Sergio Ramirez, R-A-M-I-R-E-Z? Oh, okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, hi. Okay, great. Excellent workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody's comments that were very, very well, uh, received, I think, by all, us all, as well as the water board. Uh, thanks, Travis, for uh, your such a great, great job, uh, you know, with your comments on certification. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, certification should be required because it creates better operators, operators who then can carry out this exact order that we're talking about today. Uh, treatment plant operators are required to be certified. This is just an extension of that. Um, it, it is a fact, we're still having 30 million spills, I guess, at least according to that chart that was shown in 2019. So some clarification of the existing order, I think uh, would work. 
working with what we have already and clarifying some points, perhaps looking at those large spills, those uh, large quantity spills, and looking at those specific agencies and having thresholds for them to do better as, as the rest of us are. I think focusing on that would, would really be beneficial. Um, uh, as far as competing dollars, uh, I, we understand there are struggling communities out there. We serve one of those struggling communities. Uh, we also serve some affluent areas. However, we're always competing for dollars and raw wastewater spills are equivalent to drinking poor uh, quality water. So to diminish the, the, uh, the, the requirements or, or priority on raw wastewater systems to other water issues, I, I think it's, it's, it's a moot point. Uh, they're both as um, important. Uh, there, it's a fact that many, many people in the state are paying more monthly for a cable bill than they are for wastewater service. This is wastewater that's taken away from people's homes, conveyed through a series of pipes that have to be maintained and repaired. And then eventually this wastewater has to be treated. Uh, a lot of this is being done for under uh, the cost of a cable bill. So I think when we talk about monies and, and, and priorities, I think we need to put that into perspective. Uh, what's more important? cable or the environment. Um, the fact that exfiltration uh, uh, or the factor of exfiltration, I should say, is going to cost money. Putting that factor into the WDR will cost money. Uh, in one way, we're trying not to spend money by not requiring certain things, but requiring an exfiltration factor or element or whatever it's going to be called at the end will cost uh, the state money, taxpayers, ratepayers. It's going to open us up to NGO lawsuits, and we've we we know that full what that full experience is like. So I would encourage that we delete the word exfiltration, and instead we define it um, such as if if it is determined that wastewater has entered the groundwater or waters of the state, it shall be reported. Some. If we're trying to get to reporting exfiltration, we, I think we, with some wordsmithing, we can, we can get to what, what we want, but not open ourselves up to this exfiltration factor. And I say this because a local agency or a few local agencies have been sued on the exfiltration issue, and they've made a business decision to go ahead and, and settle the matter, not knowing what they're really getting themselves into. So I'd hate to put us all in the state under that same you know, scenario. And then lastly, I'll just finish up with reiterating the importance of certification. And um, this could be the most, the most significant update to this order, uh, requiring collection system workers to be operators, just as the state has required treatment plan operators to be certified in the past, it is doable. Just because there's a couple of unions out there that disagree or they have their, you know, their opinion or their position should not stop us from pursuing this. Uh, making requiring treatment operators has made water treatment better and thus has uh, contributed to helping helping the environment, the bay, the oceans, the waters of the state. Doing the same type of requirement for or something similar for collection system workers will also accomplish the state's goal and, and benefit us all in the state greatly. Thank you very much. And again, thanks for everybody involved on putting this on. Thank you, Sergio. We appreciate your comments and concerns on this informal draft order. Before Gorgog and before we move on to the next steps, Diana would like to read an email that she received. Um, yes, thank you. Um, we have an email from Ray Mendes, and Ray was at last Tuesday's workshop. His name was called, and 
there was another raised iPad that got unmuted, so he wasn't able to speak. Um, Ray is with the city of Pacifica, and Ray is also extremely involved with the uh, uh, Clean Water Environment Association Collection System Subcommittee, um, and does a lot of work and has assisted a staff with input. And basically, the email that uh, he stated uh, that he sent me um, reflects exactly what Sergio just mentioned. Uh, the importance of certification. So I wanted to make sure I got that in our discussion. I also want to state, um, and Sergio, thank you. I know you're very involved, not only with your agency and CWEA, but you do a lot of training for operator onboarding as well. Um, if we were back in 2005 right now to require certifications, um, it, it might be different. Uh, however, I would like to have further discussion uh, with you and through uh, and with CWEA representatives uh, to get a, a little bit more information and to compare the conversation we had with um, some other agencies about the, um, the unions that they had to uh, those issues they had to address with the unions. And fortunately, that would be the next step of a discussion because we did have a CWEA representative in that, um, in that conversation with that large agency that struggled um, with the unions in order to require certification. Um, so thank you very much. And thanks to Bruce for letting me fit in Ray Mendez's comments. Thank you, Diana. All right, so with that, that concludes our current session of the question and comments portion of today's workshop. Um, we will revisit this uh, towards the end once we wrap up the next steps uh, uh, phase of today's workshop, which Diana will be walking us yeah. through. So Diana, you're up. All right, next slide, please. Wonderful. So I'll do this as quickly as I can. Uh, this slide shows the uh, full public process of this order and other statewide orders uh, that are issued here through the State Water Board and the Division of uh, Water Quality. Um, so to the very left, um, on the top, you see staff outreach, and we started that back in 2018, more seriously in 2019. Um, and so we, we are basically right now on the second and third dot from the left. We've issued out an informal draft um, and that issuance actually started per CASA's request asking if they can at minimum see an administrative draft, a working draft. And we wanted to make sure we got that out to everyone for transparency. And that's why it may seem like right now this is a formal draft, uh, but it is not. It is an informal uh, working draft. We're holding our public workshops now. We're going to continue on with focused meetings. Um, and at this time, I believe as in our Division of Water Quality, we have, we have time to continue a really addressing these issues. I am not yet feeling um, any pressure from um, expectations on having to get a formal draft out immediately. However, we do like to work as, uh, we do like to work efficiently. Um, so um, as once we get to preparing a formal draft order, that would proceed then um, with our staff initiation of a public comment period for formal written comments. Um, a statewide order this large uh, would be at minimum, we would have a public comment period at minimum of 45 days, uh, more likely maybe 60 days. Our state water board likes to have a public hearing um, in the middle of the public comment period um, because they like to hear directly from folks like you um, talking directly to them as board members. So, um, so we typically schedule a, a public board hearing in the middle of the public comment period. 
Um, once that public comment period comes to a close, there's a due date for written comments. Then we look at all the comments. We continue having discussions. Um, throughout this process, we continue um, briefing our executive director um, as, and she maintain, um, maintains communication with the board members. We keep the board members um, updated on the issues that uh, interested parties um, still have concern about. Uh, we respond to the comments, then we prepare a final draft that then is presented in front of the state water board for their consideration of adoption at a formal board meeting. Um, for all the years I've been with the water boards, I very rarely have seen a water board adopt a large order like this without uh, making some changes even during the adoption meeting. So during the adoption meeting, there's still opportunity for interested parties to speak. And there's times that our board will say, staff, take 20 minutes to rewrite this portion um, to address these concerns. So, um, so that's why I want to stress that nothing is in stone until the board actually takes the action to adopt an order. And that's the process. All right, uh, next slide, please. So that concludes uh, today's public workshop. As I mentioned, we will be going into the after hour session of the uh, question and comment session. But for everyone else, thank you for your participation uh, today. It was a pleasure getting the opportunity to connect with all of you virtually. Uh, all information uh, provided during this workshop will be available on the Sanitary Sewer Systems Program webpage. Uh, additionally, if you are aware of other interested parties that have not subscribed to our statewide email system, especially uh, our small and disadvantaged communities, uh, please pass this information to them uh, as we will be providing further updates through the email system. And so for folks that need to drop off the Zoom call right now, um, enjoy the rest of the day. Have an amazing weekend. But for those of you who want to stay after hours um, for additional uh, questions or comments, uh, feel welcome to do so right now. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over back. I'll turn it back over to Afruz. Thank you, Gorgag. And hopefully we can answer to all of the questions that we have received in this half an hour that's left. Um, we have a question from Jason Lofton. For incentive-based reduced reporting, will the spill criteria less than two spills per hundred miles? exclude lower lateral spill counts. Not, a, not all agencies own the lower laterals and it makes sense that the order should pick a spill criteria that compares agency performance cons consistently. Diana, would you like to answer Jason's question? Yes, um, Jason, that's a good comment because um, you you do have or the enrollees that are responsible for the lower laterals do have um, many more small spills. Uh, and with that um, also comes the inequity of um, when those little small spills are actually reported and when they're not. And we do not want to provide an incentive for um, enrollees not to report. Um, we want to make sure we do apples and apples. Uh, good comment. And I do see that we need to uh, make some changes in that section and um, to put some acknowledgement and some difference um, for, for the enrollees that manage the lower laterals. Okay, great. Thank you, Jason and Diana. Another comment from Michael Fontana. Changes to the SSMP, SSO categories and reporting, resiliency plan, audit timeline, and or staff training takes time. The order should allow agencies time to incorporate new additional WDR requirements. 
The water quality monitoring requirements in attachment E section two and three are confusing on what is required for what type of spill and associated reporting. In addition, it is not very clear on the purpose of estimating the travel time, sampling locations, and fuel parameters required. Mm -hmm. Staff time is very valuable, so we want to make sure they are expending resources in the most efficient way to stop and contain the spill, especially during an emergency requiring additional monitoring and calculations that are not useful, diverse resources from the go. Thank you, Michael, for your uh, great comment. We will definitely consider your comment in revising the informal draft. N next, we have a question from J Jeffrey Staker. What has been done with all the data collected by Region 9 on PLS over the last 15 years? Have there been fines levied to homeowners that refused to repair their laterals? Um, Jeffrey, I believe we don't have any staff from Region 9, so I cannot provide a, an answer to your question. Does anybody else? Any of the water board staff have an answer? Mm. I hear none, so I'm gonna move on to a comment from Jeffrey. The two hour reporting requirement seems extremely unreasonable when responding to a spill, especially after hours or on holidays. The focus and energy must be on re reliving the stoppage, not meeting a two hour reporting requirement. Yes, we have heard this a lot and we will definitely have internal conversations on um, this requirement. Thank you for your comment. Um, we have a question from Pratik Harn, and I think Debbie West Webster has the same question. When is the informal draft order anticipated? And when will be the effective, I'm sorry, when is the formal draft order anticipated? And when will be the effective date? Um, at this time, we don't have a definitive uh, date for releasing the formal draft. We have to have, we are going to have subsequent conversations with CASA and environmental groups and other interested parties and uh, address many of your concerns in this informal draft before we can release the formal draft order. Mm. So I don't have a date for that. Um, Hannah Dodd uh, has a comment. I'm a consultant who regularly performs third-party audits on existing SSMPs. If agencies have to add new attachments to their SSMP to comply with this new regulation and SSMPs are not written in the order of the sections of the new regulation, it may take longer for auditors to review than current SSMPs and, long, uh, and likely longer than the March 1st deadline in section 5.11 and therefore increase the cost of permit performing SSMP audits. Thank you, Hannah, for your comment. Jim Fisher has a question. Would the water boards consider adding a new requirement for an industry advisory committee, which is open to the public to be added into the current staff draft proposed order to help enhance guide implementation, compliance and enforcement, including periodic public review. This order post-adoption. Diana, would you like to respond to Jim Fisher's question? 
Yes, I'd like to respond to Jim's question and also to touch on Debbie Webster's second question also. Um, and so Jim, that's a, that's a interesting approach about um, an advisory committee. One of the things that I think we can all agree on is we're in way too many meetings. Um, however, that's probably really necessary. Um, my, my thoughts, and I'll throw this out there, um, is that maybe a good place for that to be wouldn't be in the order. Uh, maybe it would be like in, a, in the existing memorandum of agreements with um, CWEA and expand that agreement um, that we would work jointly, uh, the water board staff and CWEA would work jointly on um, facilitating an advisory committee and taking in that input or something together with um, CASA uh, or so forth. We would not want to put uh, the, the requirement probably directly in an order, um, but we have seen, especially through our stormwater orders, um, advisory committees form and take formal fee and the state water board takes formal feedback from those committees. Um, so that's a that's a very good comment. Let's let's keep thinking about that. Um, I want to address a question that uh, Ms. Webster had about when would the effective date of the order be. So um, so when the board adopts an order. Um, that's the adoption date. And then the board is able to state when is when does the order go into effect. Um, typically, statewide orders do not go into effect any sooner than 90 days after an adoption date. However, with statewide orders, we always take into account what it takes for um, uh, our water boards uh, to get um, up to speed with the new requirements, such as with CWIX, as well as enrollees to do so. So that uh, effective date is a component that um, we, we as staff recommend, and it's also always ends up being an issue of discussion um, at the adoption meeting also. Um, we definitely would want an effective date to be one that is feasible. There is also an effective date equivalent in the informal order when it comes to updating the sewer system management plans. There's a, there's a statement in there right now that any enrollee that has a required update of their management plan within, I think it's two years of the adoption date, that they get up to their next required update due date um, to upgrade their plan. Uh, for the system resiliency requirements. So that means they would have up to seven years. Um, so there's there's several effective dates there. I hope I answered your question. Ed, I see, thanks Diana. Uh, Ed also has a question regarding the estimated dates for each phase of the development process. As I mentioned earlier, at this point, we don't have any dates, it will take us some time to finalize this informal draft and then take it to the board. Um, I believe we have read everybody's comments and questions and everybody who, um, I haven't called on, please put in the chat box. I see a chat from Paul um, that says, why can't the re-adopting period be six years to deal with three audits before re-adoption? Diana, would you like to respond to Paul? Sure, and I'm going to make the assumption that you mean the update of the sewer system management plan and not the re-adoption of the order. Um, so why can't it be six years? There's no reason it can't be six years. Um, we've, we even had talked in previous stakeholder discussions about um, three, three, and two, which means an audit done every three years and then the 
management plan updated on the eighth year because you can't just have an it's it's hard if you're all that time you have to look at logistics um and so there's no reason that can't change um for us we were thinking is that going to be too much time in between audits um we did get some feedback when we were talking about the three three and two on um well, you know, that actually makes our audits even um, more difficult to do because it's over a longer time period. Um, but there's no reason we can't consider um, the six years, which would basically be two, two, and two. So thank you for your comment. Thanks, Diana. I think that concludes the question and comment session. Gorgogan, back to you. Uh, alrighty. Um, in that case, uh, if there's no other further questions or comments that folks want to ask, uh, we will now be concluding today's public workshop. Again, appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy schedules to participate and join us virtually. Um, and with that, we look forward to further communications with everyone as well. Uh, with that, have an amazing weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you.